Oh, while that uh, goes live, I'm live, it says, I hope. Hello, everybody. Sorry that we uh, we are starting a bit later than our planned. Um, got caught in the middle of something uh, before I got everything set up. So I am still juggling stuff, including filling up my drink. But I'm probably going to run out of it soon enough. Okie okay, doke. Welcome. Hello, everyone. So, um, let's do some more development. I am juggling a little bit, or still sort of making up my mind um, what I am going to be focusing on tonight. Um, I've got half a mind just to continue on the little drum game that uh, that I was doing. Um, but I've also had in my mind for a while to dive back into GD extensions. So, um, don't know if anybody who is uh, watching right now has any preference. Let your uh, you know let your wishes know in the uh, in the chat. I'd I'd say should we continue on the drum game? Should we do something with GD extension? Uh, should I do something else? Uh, what are you guys interested in seeing tonight? Um, and while we uh, we make up our minds, um, I just want to um, revisit our game jam. Just letting everybody know that. Uh, we are organizing a game jam in the about two weeks' time. Um, it says 13 days, 12 hours, uh, which is because I've scheduled it for a um, a Saturday morning here in Sydney, but it's going to be a Friday night for, uh, for most people in the world. Um, I don't think we're going to be super strict on the exact um, starting time. Uh, we'll probably... Uh, announce the uh, the theme sometime on on the Friday, uh, so possibly uh, sometime on uh, um, the thirtieth of November, slash uh, very early on the first of December. We will see how things go. Um, but yeah, if you uh, enjoy uh, doing stuff with Godot and you want to try out XR. Um, our game jam is going to be a really really good opportunity for that. Um, both myself and Malcolm are planning to do uh, a bunch of sessions or videos or something along those lines in the next two weeks to uh, to sort of uh, prepare some stuff for uh, for anybody who wants to join the jam. Uh, we have a template um, project uh, ready for anybody who wants to use uh, XR tools to create a VR game or application. Um, and we are about halfway done, three quarters done, with a template for the Tilt 5 headsets. Um, so anybody who wants to uh, wants to join in with the game jam uh, and, and get a head start working on Tilt 5, then uh, and that's an option. Um, on the Tilt 5 subject, uh, for those people who have been atten uh, keeping attention to Twitter, Tilt 5 has offered up a number of loaner devices for anybody who wants to join the game jam. Uh, so if you uh, you think um, you could actually do something with that, uh, reach out to them and see if uh, um, if if it's uh, in time and able to uh, to get a headset from them. Um, and again, there's there's going to be uh, um, you know some stuff coming from me and Malcolm and Patrick uh, around Tilt 5 to uh, to help people get started with that. Um, we're also planning, if all goes well, uh, to have a stream on the Tilt 5 Twitch channel. Um, let's see if I can remember where that is. Twitch TV, well, Tilt 5, there we go. So anybody who wants to uh, have a look at that, you can see that uh, Jason is mixing up his name now. So my apologies. I haven't spoke to him earlier this morning. I'm terrible at this. Uh, but he just did a, a couple of uh, streams just this morning. It was Should be fun. Um, okay, so uh, unfortunately, nothing in chat yet. Um, so again, for the people who just joined, who weren't here, um, you know, at the beginning, uh, again, my apologies for starting a bit late. Um, I'm still juggling what we are going to be uh, doing today, whether I'm going to continue with my drum game that uh, that I did last week, 
Um, or if we are going to have a look at GD extension, I've been wanting to uh, to build a new GD extension from scratch. So that could be interesting to have a look at. I know that's not strictly VR related, uh, but it is something that uh, that could interest people um, or maybe something else. So, uh, so let me know in chat, is there a preference? Uh, I guess if we don't hear anything in, in, in chat, I am going to uh, simply continue with the drum game. But um, yeah. Um, Looking if there's uh, there are people who would rather say like hey Bass can't you spend some time on this or that um, just to uh, to see uh, if there are other things that we could do. Alrighty, uh, let's see how far this but this compiled now. I have to unfortunately also recompile my project. So where is my tiles? Here we go. I also just want to do those. I don't think I'll be using the Android templates today. So just in case, um, I was working on another PR today, so I have to compile back to the one that contains the changes that I want to use. Alrighty. Um, and now I'm sort of wondering, did I actually use Godot 4.2 last week? I think so. Um, so let's go and start that up and see where we are. Uh, that also means that I need to go and start up the Oculus app. Let's see how that all goes. Um, because... Ah, there it is. So it's all the way down there. Uh, because I'm going to be using my, uh, my trusty uh, Pro today. Um, which also actually means that I better put my pro in a link mode. Oh yeah, still those warnings. I haven't updated it yet. Uh, bum, 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 bum. All right, come on, Mr. Quest Pro. There we go. Quest Link. Why are you not connected to Wi-Fi? What's that about? Come yeah, on. Searching for networks, it says. Um, but you can just go over cable. What are you? Why is it being difficult? Have I got the wrong cable? No, I've got the right cable. It's in there. It's on. I think I might have to restart my computer. That would not be cool if that's true. Dun, 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 dun. All right, guys, that would be uncool if that is true. If I have to restart my computer, we'll have a uh, a quick break in the stream. Um, well, that's a good bit of... Oh, hold on. One thing that might help is if I just shut you down. Um... How do we, uh, really? Uh, what is the list of devices again? Oh, no, listen on, no, that's not what I want. Oh, just ADB devices minus go. So, Crash Pro can be found. Nice, no. Why can I not use link? All right, go back on you. This is really strange. Yeah, I have to be streaming right now. Because I'm busy. Bye. Um, hold up. I think Ollie's mom's trying to reach you. Yeah, I just saw my, my phone ring, but I'm kind of in the middle of something right now. Um, but for some reason, Okay, hold on. 
Maybe if I just restart my quests, would that work? And let's go power back on. Yeah, man. We can go back on. All right, let's just let that cycle back on and see if that works. Um, hold on, let me send the person who's trying to reach me a message that I'm in the middle of something. Uh, Okie dokie. Um, so that bit. <laughs> Casper, how are you going? Yeah, it's uh, well, in this case, it's not completely. Now, yeah, the restart seems to have worked. So, why? Okay. Yay, that's all working. Okay. Actually, let's just try out if this will work. So I don't know why my quest didn't want to connect to Wi-Fi, but it's back on Wi-Fi. And uh, but my oh, that's probably my own fault. Haha. <laughs> that is because we did not set up all the action maps. And we need to add a profile for a touch controller. And we need to add our poses. Okay, we need our haptic output. There we go. There we go. And we now don't need that one because we get that for free. Uh, with the quest. Okay. And now they do work. Um, but I am, of course, too far away from the thing, but also, yeah, that's, that's a point. Boop. Let me sit back a bit more. You guys hear it better than I do because these um, aren't playing the headset. And that is, of course, because last week we were using the index. And the index has the nice uh, routing for the sound. So I hope you guys could hear the sound, but I couldn't, which is a bit of an annoying thing. Um, you guys might have heard it even with a little bit of an echo because my headset is lying close to the thing. Let's have a look at that. Let's move that over here. How am I going to do this? Um, is my index still connected? That's the other question. Because maybe I should be using the index instead again. Index key. That is connected. No. Looks like it's still connected. Okay, so should I just reuse my index tonight? That might be... Uh, this is how you prepare a stream, everybody. Um, make sure that everything's up and running before you start your stream instead of doing it live on stream and struggling. <laughs> okay, let me just move this out of the way. 
Move you out of the way. Close you. Hold on. Okay. And I move you. You can go over there. This guy. And then, of course, all my cables are messed up. And there we go. Oh. You good, uh, Blakey? Oh, uh, yeah, Ollie just called. We were going to his place, but I'd be there by 10 to 11. Oh, are you going to get up that early? No. <laughs> You're getting up that early. I'm going to get up. Okay, okay. Because we need to drive Ollie. Okay. We're going out somewhere with a bunch of uh, people. Oh, that sounds like a plan. Yeah. And uh, his mom said to call her back, like when you're gone. Well, that's that's not until midnight, so. But. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. So that's all working. Um. That probably means that I should. Um. That means that I need to restart you. That also means that I am going to have to go. Can I start it like this? I don't know if I can start it like this. Ba -ba -ba All right, let's indeed hope that I still have everything connected properly. And of course, my controllers keep shutting down. Okay, so do I need to then just run Steam? So annoying. Because my Oculus is my current. Uh, Oh, okay. Um, let's move that forward a bit because I'm probably because I was quite a bit back, so that's probably why my mic volume isn't good. But let's go and turn that guy a bit down, and we'll see if that is um, good enough for what we need to do. So I do think that if I look at um, sound mixer options. If I remember correctly, get oh, then I need to restart Gido first. Let's let's get Steam VR running. For, oh, hey, where do you go? Where are you? Oh, by the way, I need to exit. Okay, Steam, come on, don't do this to me. What is your problem? Um, do -do 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 -do. so there we go, da -da -da, da -da -da. and I need to go and start you. Come on. There we go. Not the mic, I promise you. Um, that's a spike disconnected. So it is not connected. Why not connected, buddy? Why are you not connected? Hold on. Let's go. That one's in. That one's in. Oh, that one's not in. Yeah, that'll slow me down there. You need to go in, and you need to go in. There we go. Now, get up. Let's see. Um. Yeah, we got lights. And there we go. So now I can go into. Settings, OpenXR, set Steam VR as the OpenXR runtime. Yay. Okay. You go down. Don't need you anymore. Um, so the thing that I needed to double check is if we now restart Godot and we restart go drums. Now we look here is Godot nicely saying. Where are you? Um, here we go. They're going to default. That's not what we want. Or is that set up correctly in here? So what we're doing here now is we're going to settings and audio. And we can see that our audio yeah, mirroring is to um, Wavelink. So this is what is one thing why I really like using uh, Steam VR um for something like streaming because i now have the audio for me nicely going through the headset and through audio mirroring i am nicely sending it to my mixer so that you guys can hear the sound 
Um, and then as a bonus, in my mixer, um, I can turn the sound up and down um, so that, you know, things don't all have to be too loud. So with that all running properly, hopefully, finally, after way too much time, um, let's run this again and see if we now have everything working the way that it should. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, there we go. Ooh. Okay, so I do need to move backwards a little bit, but I can hit the drum and I can hear. So now the question is, how's the sound for you guys? Is my voice loud enough? Uh, was the drum sound too high or too low? Uh, where uh, where do we stand with this part of it? There we go. I'm gonna zip the mic. All right. Cool. That's all working. Both of my uh, um, my lighthouses are visible. Cool. Um. So last week we got to the point where we can hit all the drums. We have a few different drum setup and a couple of cymbal setup. That is really annoying. Those uh, those uh, errors. Um, those, by the way, are being fixed. Uh, I'm on a slightly older um, um, version of Godot, so um, they might already have been fixed. I'm not sure. Uh, I need to rebase this uh, this one, but I've got a couple of uh, enhancements in this. Uh, um this branch that i'm on right now that i want to take uh or make use of um so yeah so we have a number of different drums for now we just have some really basic shapes set up in godot um just as placeholders the thing that is important is that with our little drumsticks we can hit the various drums and the two uh, uh symbols such hi-hats all right cool to hear that thank you casper um so we can hit them all, and depending on which one we hit, we play a different sound. So the way that this all works, I don't know if, uh, if everybody has followed along last week, but just to bring everybody up to speed, um, the way this works is that all these drums are based on the same uh, instrument scene. And in the instrument scene, uh, we specify what the, um, the sound is that we play when this instrument is hit. Um, we have a max strike velocity and a strike volume curve. Basically, we measure how fast we are moving our stick when we hit um, our instrument. And based on that, we, uh, we adjust the volume up and down. And this gives us some control. So for instance, for a tom drum, that's uh, a implementation of an instrument. You can see that there is a sound that we play. Um, and then there is a curve um, that goes from actually making the sound softer to uh, basically on the the zero line here, with the sound being in its original volume, uh, all the way to uh, um, to our maximum um, decibel value, because these values are in decibel. Um, and that is the way that we currently control the volume when we hit the drum. Now, I haven't really played around with this curve to find out what works best. For now, what I find uh, or what I found most important is that if we hit the uh, the drum, we uh, we get a sound. If we hit it very slowly, we get a soft sound, and if we hammer it hard, we get a, a loud sound. So that works. And in that way, we've created a, a tom drum, which is uh, this guy, a floor drum, which is just a, a bigger drum. So. Really, the shape, of course, doesn't matter. All that matters uh, is that we have a different sound there. We have a snare drum. We have a uh, a cymbal, and we have a hi hat. And again, the, um, the the shapes are just placeholders for now. the uh, The important bit is that we uh, we play a sound when we hit the uh, the drum. Now, if you are good at uh, uh, at playing the drums, which uh, I indefinitely am not. Um, you could already use this to play some uh, some music with, some drum music. Um, in, in theory, this is a basic drum setup, and it's working. 
for what we're trying to build here, which is a, a small rhythm game, um, we are assuming that the person playing does not know how to play the drums because it's supposed to be a fun rhythm game, a bit of a arcadey experience. Um, and that helps me as well because I don't know how to play the drums as well. So uh, we're gonna try and see if we can turn this into something fun. And the way obviously that rhythm games work is that in a rhythm game, we play a song and as the song is playing, we see objects coming towards us. Um, and as long as we hit the right drum um, at the right time, uh, you know, obviously being signaled by those objects moving towards us, um, the, the song plays the way that it should be playing. Um, it takes a while to come from where we are right now to, to get where we want to uh, go. Uh, I even need to find some good music um, and, and preferably music that um where i can um obviously disable the drum track because the in the end it is going to be the drum track being played by what we're doing um um in our drum game itself um but before we get there we can do a lot of preparation to uh to make something like that work um and the idea that i had with that is that um you have your song and next to your song in the rhythm game itself, inside of uh, of Argado, we define the, the the play tracks on which the player will be playing. Now we can prepare the whole play track logic without having a song ready to play because it's just a matter of defining, you know, how um, how the strong you know, the song data is structured capturing that somewhere, you know, even if it's in a temporary thing to make everything work, and uh, and then seeing if we can uh, make something visual on which we can play. Now, for us, that means that every instrument that we have will have such a play track where we're going to see those notes. And the idea that I have there is that we are going to link up our instruments with a play track. And those two will have to work together um all right so what we're going to have to do first is come up with a way to um to have the song and all the the play information in memory so that these um um all these things can be linked up to that so let's think of that first um and for that i'm going to create a singleton object uh, because this is information that i want to have um, available um, globally so when we select a new uh, song we would load the song data into this global object um, and then start playing uh, that song so for that, we're going to go and create a, uh, actually, we need to just create a new script. Um, and let's just create a new folder for that. And now I need to think of a good name. Now in the, uh, one of the um, tutorials that I followed around rhythm games, they called it the conductor. And I'm wondering if I should keep to that same name. I think I will. I'm just going to create a folder called conductor and in that we're going to create a new script and I'm going to call that script conductor. We'll likely have additional scripts in here that that, that help us um, define um, you know the the song data but we're going to start with that and then in our project settings in our auto load we are going to go and select that script and we're going to go and add that in and that means that as our um, game starts, we will have uh, a um, global variable called conductor, and that will be an instance of this script. Cool. Hey, Francesco, how are you going? Cool. All right. So obviously, um, and I'm just going to put this in here for now. Um, I'm actually going to call that an export bar um audio track let's see that should be an audio stream 
pretty sure that's just an audio stream and we're going to leave that alone that is for future music so once we have a um a song that we're playing in the background this will um have that um song stored and that's eventually we're going to link that into an audio player um and we're going to make sure that our audio stream is played in that uh that audio stream player okay the next thing that we need to have is the play tracks that we want and for that we are going to again create a, a new um scene file and we're going to oops, not scene file a new script file here we go and we are going to call that um just call it i'll just call it track it has to have a name for now um, this one I'm going to give class. Oh, that was not this one. Why it, does it not just open that straight away? That's crazy. Um, actually, let's also, before I do that, clean up a bit from last time. There we go. So we just have the classes open that we actually need. And we're going to go give this a class name. Um, we'll go back. I'm just prefixing things with our, uh, our current um, um, project name. So I've called this project Go Go Drums not very imaginative but it works um i kind of like prefixing class names with something that relates to the project that we currently have so that we don't get an overlap in names with um plugins that we might add to this at some point in time or with those built-in um, node names so go go track is going to uh contain um all the information for one instrument basically so this is a track that we then for instance will be linking to and i should actually really do that in the main script um so we would link that say that to this drum so this drum will be playing the notes that are stored in this particular track cool so go back to scripts um track so what does our track need to uh contain is obviously um Okay, that's a good one. How am I going to do that? Because the idea would be, right now we've kind of hard-coded the drum set that we're using, but the idea that I actually have is that when you load um, a song, so you would be loading both the audio of that song and the track data, uh, eventually we'll find a way to save this information or store this information on disk. Um, that the track data actually contains all the information about the individual drums uh, or instruments that we want to do. So in preparation of that, uh, the first thing that we want to do here is create an export of our, um, and we're going to call that uh, instrument. Um, and that actually means that, oh, look at that. We already had giving that a uh, prefix. So. Uh, Let's stick with the prefix that we already have. And we're gonna say, this is going to be a GD instrument. And that should allow us to link a scene of type GD instrument to this. Now, the question at this point in time, is that going to be a scene instance or is this going to be, um, possible to actually link to the instrument scenes so that we can instance a new one. Um, let's see, do we, can we get help on export? <clears throat> no. That's part of the directory, that's not what we want. We might want to switch to that one. Actually, come to think of it, if we want to do it like that, then we actually want this to be a resource. 
And we would actually want to have, yeah, this was only for derived. No, that's fine. That makes sense now because it's need not the node instance that we want to link here. We want to, um, so let's get back to that in a second. Um, because it actually means that we want to also create um, the script here for the song itself. And we're actually going to make that a resource as well. And that means that we're actually going to go and move that into the song. There we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. And instead here, we can now say um, export var uh, song is the song. So that is the song that we are going to have loaded at the beginning. Um, all right. So what we're now going to do is we are going to go and hit plus here. Uh, we're going to go and select our GD song resource. So now we have a new resource created of this GD song type. You can already see that we can select a new audio track here. As I said, that's going to be for later. I'm going to go and save this and let's go and um, create a new folder here for songs. Um, and we're going to call this a test song because we're testing with that one and uh, we can go start setting that up. So eventually we'll have a, um, a resource file of type GD song that contains all our information of the song that we are playing and a audio file next to that. And obviously a number of, um, you know, instrument files, but um, yeah. So now what we can do is we can go and create a uh, new export var. Um, and we're gonna call that tracks. And that's going to be an array of type GD track. So now that we do that, we can see that all of a sudden we have a, um, a thing here for tracks. So let's say that our song right now just has one track. And now we can go and create a new track here. And we can start um, doing that. So the way that we're doing it right now is by creating it uh, or turning it into a resource. Um, we can actually construct our song data inside of our EDA. And while this is not going to be a very comfy um, um, interface to do that in, it is something that will at least allow us to set up a, um, uh, an initial uh, version. All right, the other thing that we obviously want to do is when we start our game for now, um, is we want to go and load our um, test song as the, uh, the initial song that we are going to play. So in here, we're going to say, so, excuse me, is preload um, test song. I don't know if I need to put an instance behind this. Let's see what our warnings say and use parameter. I don't care. Let's go get rid of that. We don't need that right now. So in theory, that should mean that when we start our game, we can test this real quick. Boom. All right. So that's uh, that's our uh, press A to center. So remember it last week for those people who were there. Um, there we go. Hello. Um, last week we made it so that if your head's too far away from there, it turns to black. And when we haven't got our headset on yet, uh, we're also defaulting to black. Woo! -hoo! Release candidate for 4.2 was released. That's really great news. That is really cool. Um, I'm using actually something in here that is um, scheduled for 4.3, which is uh, not really turned on right now. Maybe I don't know. Is it turned on? Because I did add it in. Project project settings demo. We are on the compatibility renderer. Oh, these are four times. That's interesting. So, ah, uh, no, that makes sense. <laughs> I 
I always forget about that. Um, the preview that you guys are seeing on screen is actually scaled down. So I can see all the nice Antia aliasing uh, in here, but you guys still get to see all the blocky blocky stuff. Um, although actually that probably could also be, yeah, that's right. Well, I can at least see the uh, the uh, anti-aliasing working inside of the headset. I'm not quite sure if it was working very well on the preview. Because again, the preview is already a scaled down version of the end result of what I'm seeing inside of the headset. Seeing that we are rendering at far higher resolution than what we're displaying on the screen. Anyway, um, oh, the whole reason I wanted to start this wasn't for that. It's so that I can go into my remote here. We can now see our conductor. And we can see that our test song is indeed loaded with our track. So that's just what the thing that I wanted to verify was actually happening. Um, so yeah, so we can go and configure, first of all, our code, obviously, but also um, set up our, um, uh, our resource for our test song in the EDA, and eventually, you know, we'll make a nice editor for uh, uh, for making it easy to create the songs. But for now, we at least have a way to get our data into our game. It's cool. And the next thing that we obviously need to know is our beats per minute. Um. I don't think there's any point in making that a floating point. So that can just be an integer. And uh, let's just say 160 beats per minute. For some reason that sounds familiar, but I have no idea if that's gonna to be too fast. Um, but we'll see, we can easily adjust that. But this is how quickly we are going to go through our, uh, our beats. What I also want to define at this point is um, a variable on uh, delay beats. Actually, delay start. And um, let's say that we delay. It's going too much. 16, that's a 16 for now. We'll see if that is going to be too much or too late. So, the idea here is that obviously our notes are going to be. Uh, some distance away. We have to have some time to get the notes to us. We also need a little bit of um, leeway in, um, because that's the other thing, and I did not open that up. I did open it up last time we were doing the stream. Uh, let's see how quickly we can uh, and find that back again. I think it's this one. Yes, it is. Um, because we have this whole... Um, latency thing that we need to uh, take care of. So we want to, first of all, wait before the song begins so that the first notes have some time to reach us. And the second thing that we want to do is um, take into account the latency in playing so that we can offset that a little bit. Now, when we look at this whole thing, um, the whole description here, we're going to ignore that tonight. <laughs> um, tonight, we're not yet ready to actually play a song in the background. We're just building the process for being able to show notes and play the notes. So we are going to be using um, our uh, normal process delta to uh, uh, to see how much time has passed. But we're eventually going to uh, replace that with similar logic as we have over here, where we get the, uh, the time um, that has passed since the uh, uh, you know, the beginning of the, the song being played. So we need to get that uh, player, get playback position, uh, plus the time uh, since last mix. And we're going to go and um, use that information as our input. But for tonight, we're just going to use the normal, um, the normal clock. And again, there's going to be, you know, a, a delay with our start delay in that calculation. And that will just mean, also mean that we, we delay starting playing the song uh, based on that. So that's, uh, that's something that's coming. For now, that is what we're going to work with. So, um, 
let's see, that's actually kind of interesting as well, but obviously that has absolutely no purpose being in a resource. But we can now go and, uh, no, we cannot do that because now we need to do that with a file, I think. Um, so now I have to think, because I know how to do this in Godot 3, but I am um, slightly unsure what the right way is um, for Godot 4. Now the other thing is, let's just get that warning up again. We have a nodes. Um, or is that simply a matter of no? Because if you do, if I do packed scene, I can't type it. You can't limit it to something. So we would probably want to use. property hint file. Well, that just says the types. Eh, that's a bit, because basically that means that we would need to do export file, and that would be star ESCN. Okay, so it needs to be type string. There we go. So now we can go into our track and we can say, well, this guy is going to be a um, just a tom drum. So let's say that that's a tom drum string. Oh, sorry, that's just the old error. I'm just uh, distracted by that one, but that's from before we changed this. Um, so we've got that now set, but there's no way that I can restrict this uh, to selecting a specific instrument. Hmm. So the other way that we could do this, which might be nicer, The thing that I'm thinking about is creating a resource file for the individual instruments that we have. Because, again, the, the long-term idea is that when you select a song, we load the song, we get all the track information, and then we can instance these instruments. So we can have different drum layouts depending on the song that we are playing. We can have a different number of drums. So let's say that some of the harder songs to play will have uh, more drums. Um, or maybe even other instruments, right? There might be a cowbell in there or a triangle or whatever. Now, one th way to do this is to create a set of resource files for the different instruments so that we can say which instrument it is, what the lo location of that instrument is, or we do that in the track where we now, like we do right now, we say this is the instrument that we are selecting, and we therefore will also have an export var location, which becomes a transform 3D. So obviously right now that is just for, um, uh, that's a shame that that is doing it like that. That's annoying. I was hoping that we have we would have our proper transform uh, um, thingy. Um, but anyway, that's eventually something that we will uh, put into our song editor once we start building that, because what that means is that, again, instead of in our main scene having these hard-coded drums, is that when you are creating the song data, is that you say, well, add a new track, select an instrument, and you know, here's a, the, the, the drum or the instrument that you select, and then you drag it into, you know, wherever you want it in your um, your view, which uh, is going to be really interesting um, in VR because we can actually, um, you know, use our controller to pick up our instrument and place it where we want it to be. And we can create that. Because, of course, eventually I want the whole song composition to be in VR itself as well. Uh, for now, we are just going to have this as skeleton information. We're not actually going to be um, implementing any of the creation logic yet. Um, but eventually we, uh, we will, we uh, will start 
um, enhancing this information. Right now, I just want all the pieces of the puzzle in place. Okay. Um, so with that, we now, on our track, need to have our notes. Now, the cool thing with our notes, because of the way that we are um, constructing this, is um, we just need a yes or no. <laughs> um, the only thing that I am thinking about is when we are looking at a, a track, is if we would have a difficulty level between songs, um, let's say that we have the difficulties level of easy, normal, and hard, is that basically on hard mode, you have to play every uh, note in the track. So let's say that um, I have a very fast uh, drum beat. So basically, every beat I have to hit the drums. Uh, I really need to do two-handed, you know, hit the drum. Ding, 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 ding. Um, is that basically for every beat, I have a note. In hard mode, I have to play every beat. In normal mode, I have to play every other beat, and the um, and we also only display every other beat. But the computer plays the off beats for us. And in easy mode, we only have to hit every one in four um, notes, and the computer plays the other three notes. Um, so that's something that I'm thinking about. So what we could do here is to rate the, um, probably that should then be an enum, I guess. So yeah, we would have an enum. What's the syntax for enum here? Okay, just bam, bam, bam. Um, that thing needs to have a name. Uh, my mind's going a little bit blank. We'll see that in a minute. Easy note, normal. Note and hard note, for instance. Um, is it before or after that I, I think it's before that I give the collection a name? All right. Okay. Now the next question is, are we going to create an array with notes? Um, and maybe notes therefore needs to be a separate type um, where we just have the offset or do we create a, a track array here? Then we need a no note. So that means not play. That looks a little bit overdone. Hmm. Because what we now create is that if we have a song of 160 beats per minute, we would create an array that has an entry for every beat. And they would be filled with GD no notes. Um, Yeah, I don't think that is actually a problem. If that is the data that we need, then that is the data we need. Hey, Dapper Dude! How are you going? Ha! Ah, Dapper's a good friend of mine. I always play uh, Apex with and uh, Overwatch with. So it's nice for him to drop in. All right, so let's just go on that assumption for now. So we're gonna, oops. We're gonna create an array. Can I do this? Possibly. Let's see what it does with there. So let's create an array of, um, let's give it 160. Beats. There we go. So with this being just no ding 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 trick, I can actually make every note easy. So every fourth note, I'm gonna go and make 
easy. So uh, hold on. One, two, three, one, two, three. Yep, can't see the wood for the trees. One, two, three. So that means that these notes will always need to be played by the player. There are no normal or hard notes in there. Obviously, we're not even going to be building the um, that, um, which actually also means Um, no, that does not. Or does it? Yeah, I think I want to go and put this. No, I'm happy with it being defined there because that's going to make that a, um, or do we want the easy level somewhere else? No, I'm gonna keep it there. I think that's good enough. So obviously this uh, this is no way to uh, put a song together. And actually we've got eight of these pages to fill in. Hooray. If I make a mistake here, that's gonna be very uh, interesting. Uh, I'm not gonna fill in all eight, um, eight of these. Um, for now, that's enough to, um, to get us going to to get this system up and running. Okay. So there are our notes. Cool. All right. That gives us enough of a base to work off of. Okay. Um, The reason why I was thinking about should I put the easy note there is, um, I think I'm gonna keep that that way, is obviously we need to store somewhere the um, the selection of the user, whether they select it, if they wanna play this song in easy mode or hard mode or whatever. Um, I am, by the way, going to return this here because we do indeed need to, uh, um, um, Let's implement that. Um, we'll need to implement that in a little bit. Okay, so difficulty and um, what level is it? Yeah, did you check? You know that one. Ah. <laughs> Because I didn't finish typing instead of it auto completing, it gave me an error. That's very good. Um, sure. <laughs> Does that work? I don't know. I've never tried that. Okay. Um, the, uh, the interface was giving me something there. So, um, so that's going to be the difficulty that the user selects. Now, obviously, we're going to default that for now. Um, do I need to do note level dot easy? Wondering if I have if I should keep the underscore note there because it's kind of yeah no nah, I'm gonna keep it that way. Um, I, I shouldn't overthink these things. So what we've created now is a situation where we can load the song that we want to uh, want to play. And we can specify the difficulty for the user in playing it. Um, and then obviously here we're also going to be um, adding the start and stop functions and all that sort of stuff. For now, for what we're building tonight, we're just, when the game starts, no, that's not going to be a smart idea. We need to have a way to, uh, to start the song. Um... No, I'm just going to start it right away, and if we if we miss stuff, then um, then we miss stuff. So be it. I'm not too worried about that. Um, okay, uh, that does mean that we are going to do um, um, for car is playing. Um, that's going to be a boolean. And we're gonna get a set there. 
Um, I'm just doing that as a placeholder, but eventually, uh, once we do that, um, actually, you know what? I'm going to just, just call that playing. I don't really want that to be displaying, just playing. Um, so when we set that to true, that starts our song. And when we set it to false, that's going to stop our song. Because right now we're not playing any songs. All that we're doing is flipping that value. Um, and then I guess for now, this is the bit that we, uh, we're eventually going to change when this all uh, all changes. Um, what we're going to be doing therefore is if playing time plus s delta. So we're going to add that time in there. So we have our time offset. Um, okay. And then obviously we need to start distributing the information to all the playing tracks that we have. Okay. Um. <clears throat> okay. See for now here just testing playing it through the auto starts our play. Okay, so that should um uh, do that. So I just want to um once we have an audio stream um This is just for uh, future me when uh, when we finally get that part that I don't have to uh, um, rethink what uh, <laughs> what I've got in my mind right now. Um, so we have that, um, and we're going to make a remark here is um, once we have um, our audio set a timer phase. And our songs delay start. Timer uh, determines when we start playing our song for real. I'll give. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Get that in there just to be so just in case i need to if i want to play put a, a restart in there i'm just going to make sure that we know that that one is actually temporary not new um and that'll do hopefully okay deal so we're slowly getting all the pieces of the puzzle we have our song we have our track okay cool So now we want to go and um, have something where, not for instruments, not for you, uh, um, where we're going to display our track. Um, so that I want to have a new scene for. Um, so let's go and lay that out. So we're going to go and create a new node 3D. And I'm going to put that here for now. So that's going to become called track one. Um, good question because it's actually track zero, but <laughs> um, let's not overdo it. Um, 
So the next thing that I want to do here is just add a mesh instance there. These are again just placeholders for now. Box. Um, that's a little bit big. That should do. No idea yet how long we're going to make that. Oh, actually, before I move that, no, I want to move that so that it's like this. Let's see. That should then be minus one. Perfect. Okay, now I'm going to go and save this. Save branch as that. Um, I'm actually going to make that part of my conductor. I'm going to call that track. Scene. Okay, that is probably not a good name because we already have a track GD as a resource. So let's go and rename that to display track. There we go. Not quite sure it's smart to actually put that in this folder, but we'll go with it for now. Um, so we're gonna link that up with that guy. Boom. Actually, um, who are you? You are the first Tom drum, so I'm actually going to move that over here. There we go, which means that I can now go and do something like this a little bit higher, please. I just need something that is visible. Um, what I actually also want to do um, Well, I'm just going to make a mesh instance. That's also going to be a box. And this is going to be the play line. And that's great. That's great. Boom. Boom. Okay. Move back. Let's see how far we are with that. Let's make that 1.5. Perfect. And let's give that a proper height. Let's say 0.7. Yep. And then this guy, I'm just going to move. And obviously, we will start positioning this in code eventually. For now, it's just placeholder stuff, just so that we can see where it is. That one might actually end up being longer as well. Cannot open file back to track. Why have you? Okay, sorry guys. I'm going to go and delete this. And I'm going to re-add that. <laughs> yeah, that of course is going to go like that. That was to be expected. Um. Hmm. You know what? I'm actually not going to add it there. I'm actually going to go and add it to this guy. There we go. I am going to go like that. Boom. You know what? I'm just going to go and keep the height the same. So on our play line, we will eventually... So the idea is... And actually, let's go and create a node for this as well. Um... Oops. And we call this drum set. And now we're going to go and move all of our drums on our drum set. So that becomes our drum set. And the idea eventually is that the contents of the drum set and the contents of our playline, so the tracks that are on our playline, we will generate based on the song that we load. And for now, that's all nicely hard coded. Cool. Now that means that in our track right now, I'm going to go and close. That's not good. Ooh, reconnection successful. Um, well, it's good that I was uh, filling my drink right in the middle of getting a message that I got disconnected from YouTube.
Okay. I hope uh, everything's still going good at uh, uh, the end of everybody watching. <laughs> um, okay, so here's our script that goes with our display track. So I'll save that before that goes wrong. And one of the things that we want to do here is link that up to an instrument. So obviously, again, when we uh, when we start going into a situation where we generated that, we're going to loop through our tracks. We're going to create our instruments. We're going to create the tracks for our instruments. Um, the positioning of that is all going to be based on what we store in our song data. But now we need to link our track up um, with the instrument that plays that track. And that is, of course, because when we hit the drum, not only do we play the, uh, uh, the song, um, but we catch the note. And the idea here is that, so again, when I'm on easy mode, the player needs to play the, um, the easy notes. So whenever there's an easy note on the timeline, um, we are hitting it and we are playing. And whenever there is a hard or normal note on the timeline, it is actually going to be the track that um, tells the drum to play a note because it's the computer that is helping us play the song at that point. Reconnecting. What's going on here? Hmm. Bad internet tonight. Too many people on the internet, I guess. So, um, okie dokie. Hmm. So I think the next thing that we need to do is specify a length here and that's probably something that we're just going to be having as an export variable for our cell so here export category song so there we go does that work Oh yeah, it is called song number because I don't have the other ones there yet. Okay. Um, so one of the um, variables that I want to do here is the length of the track. I'm just gonna keep that for two meters right now. Cool. Set the value, it's the same thing here. Uh, length is value. Eventually I probably wanna clamp that, but uh, for now, that's good. Actually, this could be a range uh, from one meter to five meters. And let's say that we do that in increments of 10 centimeters. Perfect. Um, if is inside three, we're going to call update length. There we go. That means that we now need a function for that update length pass. And we're also going to do that here. So the, this pattern I use quite a lot. And this is all about um, and let me think. Sorry, guys, I am uh, a little tired. It's been a long week. Um, so this is a pattern that I often do because whenever you define a property, the value of that property gets set before our entire node has been added to the node tree. So we actually don't have any access to the children. Um, so as long as it's not inside the tree, we only set the value. And then you know, obviously after that's all, all the properties are set, our ready gets called and we can now do our update length. I could do an enter tree in here, uh, but enter tree is quickly followed by ready. Uh, and very often we have other things we wanna do in ready. Um, that aren't available yet in the entry. So for us, that is great. Uh, once we then are in the tree, if after that we change the value, um, it is automatically done whenever our property changes. Now, this property, this is completely overkill. We're really never going to, uh, to set this. This is basically something that we only do in the editor. Um, and we want to just make that do something. 
the thing that it's going to do is we're going to go and grab our note line. Um, so actually what we're going to do first is oops, our mesh. Uh, that was a box mesh, I think. Excuse me. Um, we're going to do that. And now we're going to say mesh size dot Z is length. So we're going to adjust our uh, thing. Um, you know what? That's actually really dumb. And I'll explain in a second why. Um, I'm actually going to do that. Because whenever we change the size, Godot actually rebuilds the mesh. So it creates a brand new mesh and that gets sent to the, um, the GPU. So there's a bit of overhead in there. Now, one of the things that uh, really makes it go fast is when instead we say transform dot scale dot, uh, oh, this is a function scaled. That's not what I want. Um, do, 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 do. How do we do that best then? Um, That means that I need to make a copy of my transform. I'm ready bar. Um, default transform is transform. Cool. Um, and actually, I don't want that for that. I need to do that. Uh, default note line transform is going to be note line dot transform because we're going to be changing it. So here we say trans, actually, I'll just call it T in this case, transform 3D. Let's actually go and do this completely nice, type all our things, makes life easier. This is going to be default note line dot scaled. Why does it come like that? Yeah, it just needs a vector. Vector three, one, one, length. So we've made it one meter. So if we scale it on the Z uh, axis by length, it gets the length that we're assigning here. The second thing that we want to do is we want to change the origin of our transform. And that's going to become a vector three, zero, zero, minus length times two. Um, because, no, not times two, times a half, because we're making it two meters long, that means that we don't need to move it one meter into the distance. And now we can say transform, oh, note line dot transform is T. Okay. Now, the next thing that we want to do here is we actually want to turn this into a tool script. <coughs> and that means that any of this code is now run when um, this is in, um, in code. Now, I'm not quite sure why. That might mean that I need to reopen it. So let's, uh, let's make sure that that's so. Now, it, now it's probably working correctly. So now we can see that we can scale up or down our line until it is something that we actually want to see. <laughs> the drums here from Motorheads. Um, uh, good morning, by the way, Eric. Um, who knows? Uh, if someone wants to uh, put a Motorhead song together for me, then uh, I'll try and play it. I probably will not be very good at it, but I'll try and play it. And again, I want to I want to stress out that right now I am not paying any attention on the looks. We're purely building the functionality. Now that is really interesting. Why would that happen? Because that is all of a sudden not offsetting it properly. Hmm. What am I missing here? Um, 
So it's working properly here, but it wasn't suddenly working properly there. Minus one, two, that's exactly what we expect. But that's the funny thing, of course, is that when we uh, when we go here and we adjust this, and let's say that we make it four, four, and now we go back here, we'll actually see that that's all changed the way that it should be. And if we put this back to two, it's back to two. Okay. When we then open our main scene, hmm. Why does it do that? Because the other thing that is really important for doing this is because we're no longer changing our mesh, our mesh can stay a resource that is shared between all instances of this, uh, which means that if we have a second track here, so let's make a track two, and I move that over to there, I know it's com completely going wrong right now. And this one we linked to drum two, and that shoots size independently of the other one. But it looks like it's sizing it, but not positioning it. So why are you doing that? That is really interesting. Um, actually seeing that we are positioning it the way that we're doing. Because it's getting, oh, okay. So actually I don't need you. We are going to make a new transform 3D here. And we're going to scale that. We're actually not basing it on our original because we are completely placing it. And that is why it's going wrong. So now, obviously I need to reload this. Now it's working. That's right. Because the problem that I was doing here is that I'm starting with the transform that is currently saved in the scene, which I'm actually updating. So I'm sort of doubling up on the size. So now I should be able to say, hey, size that one and uh, and size that one. Now, obviously, the idea here is that they all have the same size. Um, but I really wanted to have this as a, um, well, maybe not. Maybe that is something that will eventually um, set up in the, um, which one? In the song, like how long do we, you know, how far back do we want to see the notes? And then obviously the second thing that we're going to be doing here, I just want to move these around. Good. Move. Uh, the second thing that we want to uh, want to know is um, export. I'm going to make that a range as well. Let's say eight to sixty four, and we're going to do this in. Um, well, that's a little bit tricky because I'm I'm right now assuming. So I'm actually going to keep that on one because that's the other thing is that, um, you know, songs can be four beats per melody, whatever the thing is called, or, you know, three beats or whatever the <coughs> the repeating beat uh, number of notes in, in every segment is. Whatever. You can see that I'm not a muso. I don't know the, the right terms for everything. Um, but yeah. Um, so we're just going to do that like that. Um, uh, notes. Um, actually, let's just call that notes. Um, so let's say that for now we're showing 16 notes into the future. So obviously the note that we are supposed to play, um, we are playing right when that hits here. And then you know we're we're now showing sixty notes going up. All right. Um, are we going to do something with that temporarily, or are we just going to do that when we play? <coughs> I think we're just going to do that when we play. Cool. Um. Hmm.
Yeah, I miss my packed scene notation for expert variables. Um, okay. okay. Let's create a new scene here. And we're going to call that going to be a 3D scene. And that's going to be called display note SEM. <coughs> yeah, that's fine. Actually, that's just going to be note right now. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dumb thing. I didn't have to do the, uh... okay, there we go. Easy, easily fixed, luckily. Um, so again, we're just gonna have a placeholder for now. I am really not that bothered by what it looks visually right now. We're just gonna make that a box. Um, um, Okay, let's just see what that looks like. If I do this, this, that doesn't totally not look like the way that I want it to. But, ah, because I'm an idiot. That is going to apply the scale to it, and I don't want it to apply the scale to it. Okay, oops. Yeah, that's fine enough. Um, I want it to be slightly wider, though. So, boom. There we go. Perfect. Yay. Okay, -do. so that's just uh, just a display placeholder. Um, I don't want to give that a color. So, and again, we're gonna be replacing this with other objects or or you know shapes or something that that's gonna look much nicer. And right now, I just want something as a placeholder to see what we're doing to slowly start putting things together. Okay, um, no, not shading, not that either. I just wanted to put, make this a slightly different color. There we go, we have a color, just to, uh, to at least show that differently a bit. Okay, we don't want you. And instead we want to do over here, export, Var, uh, and again, this is a problem. Is actually uh, exports var, and I think I can do that with the other thing as well. Um, not scene. Back to scene. I think I can do it like this. And now I can go and. No, it doesn't like that. Oh, it does. There we go. Load. There we go. Uh -huh. So this allows us to uh, to actually spawn in these nodes. Okie doke. Um, cool. So what we're now going to do is we're going to create a helper. Um, A helper object for or our collection of notes. That one I do want to move up by. Is it that much? How big did we make this guy? Is there for five, zero point five? Maybe that actually needs to be a little bit higher than that. So let's put it there. That one might turn out to be too high. We will see. We just need it somewhere and that's basically that is our place for where our notes um, will happen okay so if engine editor 
hint. So we don't want to run our process when we're in the editor. That's just a fail safe. Um, actually, we can do set process false. Therefore, we don't have to worry about our process doing something when we're in the editor. Um, but obviously, we want to go and um, display the note. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so the question now is, are we going to process stuff here and then instruct the display track to update or are we just going to adjust the time information here and then pull it from the display track because I think the process of the um, autoload scripts will run before the process um, methods on our display tracks. Um, I think our display track should be responsible for it. <laughs> no, I think it actually is nicer if we, um, if we push things out. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a concern. Okay, true. Um, Let's go and have an export track here. So this is going to be track zero because remember we, we're we're calculating from zero here. Um, yeah, let's do it that way. And that actually means that we're not going to be doing that. So I'm going to take that out. Instead, in tree, so we're going to go and enter tree. Is it tree? Okay, cool. Boink, 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 boink. Okay. What I want to do now is in our conductor, we are going to have a variable called display tracks. And we'll just make that an array. And we're going to have a function called uh, register display track. Um, do I give this a class name? Do we want to give this a class name? Yes, we do. Class name DVD display track. There we go. 
Oops. There we go. So now we have a display track. This is going to be an array of display tracks. This is going to be called uh, new display track. We're going to say if we don't have it yet. We're going to add that to our display track. Such a bad um, name. So here we're going to say if we do have it, we're going to erase it. And I think arrays takes our very, yes, exactly. So this means that our, um, laser. this means that our uh, conductor is going to keep track of our, um, of our display tracks. Hi, Xplats, how are you going? Uh, these are your things to help me. I'm about to release a super cool basketball game. Cool, man. Um, be sure to, um, let us know where it can be found so we can play it. If you put it on itch or if you put it on app lab or wherever you put it, um, let us know. And, uh, we will play your game once it's out. Very cool. All right. So that means that here on our enter scene, we're going to say conductor dot register display track itself. And here we're going to say conductor unregister display track itself. Okay, cool. Sweet. So in our, we have all those. That's actually exported, very cool. All right, so now we slowly need to start working on this logic. Um, What it's doing here as well is uh, to do clear display tracks. Whether we're starting or stopping doesn't really matter, but we want to clear whatever is on our display tracks. Let's uh, um, actually let's uh, let's put that in at least as code. So I like putting our public functions up. Top. So obviously we need to fill that in. Um, so let's go and do clear our tracks. And here we do for display track. Um, is it in my tracks? Track clear track. Oops, I already already completed that. Perfect. So. Obviously we need to implement that, but when we do that, we're gonna go include that. Now, here we're gonna go and update our time. So obviously um, we're going to change the way that we do that. Now we have to do a beat counter. So um, current beat is going to be time think um, our time is going to be seconds uh, so um, so if we divide our time we get our time in minutes Yep, and that is then, I guess, um, oh, sorry, bar, times 
Bomb dot beats per minute. And we want to floor that. Okay. Do I want the store? Yeah, I want to do that like this first. Beat of float is that. That is going to go like that. Um, Is F not in Fido? Yes, it is. Cool. Um, actually, that can just be, uh, can make it even easier. That's just beat line the screen beat. Okay. And I'm going to make these all floats, even though this could be an integer. Okay. So current beat is going to be the, the note that we're playing. Actually, let's call that current note. Um, now, one quick one question that we're going to ask ourselves is if we are going to <coughs> when we start the track, are we going to make this negative based on the? No, we're not. We're going to go and subtract. Oh. No, that's actually what we're going to do in, in how we're going to grab the information. Okay. Oh, great. I renamed that. That's right. Okay. Um, so we need to keep that in mind from our song. Um, the other thing that's going to be interesting. Yeah, we're going to show our current note for the duration of the beat. So we, if we hit the drum too early when it's still one beat away from us, we still have it. Because obviously we're going to be scoring it this way, right? So our track, our display track is responsible for displaying the notes. We're also going to be using our display uh, track that whenever there is a note um, that is of a higher difficulty than we're playing, is that we're not going to show that note, but instead we're going to play that note. Um, so obviously that's what happens when our current note changes. Um, but when we are showing the note, we are playing it, the player needs to hit the drum at the right time. And um, we're going to use the display track to do the scoring of that. So we need to link that up that when the player hits the note, our display track gets a signal, hey, the player hit the note. And um, we're going to score that note based on how close we are to when we're supposed to be playing that note. So that, I think, will be pretty decent. Okay. So what we can now do is, again, we loop through all our display tracks. Okay. Then we go and check um, if display track dot track smaller than um, 
in our song. Yep. Song dot tracks dot size. That gives us the number of tracks. So if our track number is within range, then what we're going to do is we're going to say display track um, update current note minus song delay start because that's in uh, in notes I think. I hope so. So how's it ring? Yeah, we did that in uh, in in beats in notes, whatever you want to call it. Um, Okay, we want to give our offset and we want to give access to our track. Cool. All right. Um, and actually, let's call that update track. Cool. Display track. So here we're going to go and get a function called update track. All right. So our notes collection is um, all the notes that we're displaying. So on our clear track, what we simply want to do is while um, actually, uh, let's say, uh, get notes is the get children boom do we do include internal it doesn't matter because this is only going to be runtime anyway um and that's the other thing um okay because this is a tool script so here we are going to do um if editor dot int Come on, auto completion. Why are you being annoying? What are you on about? I don't care. Oh, but I do care about that. Why do you mean shadow? Notes is shadowing an already declared variable at line 12. Oh. Um, I do want to use that like that. Okay. Uh, no, if editor dot is editor int. It's so weird that sometimes auto completion works and sometimes auto completion says nope because it doesn't know editor. Engine. Thank you. That's why the auto completion wasn't working. It does make sense. All right. I'm going to. Oops. Come on, copy the file. Um, like that. Boom. So again, this is logic. We just, even though it's never going to be called in the editor, we, we just want to be safe and say, if we're in the editor, this is not supposed to run. So that's something that we always do in tool scripts is make sure that code that is not supposed to run an editor is nicely handled. Notes. So we're just going to go and uh, do um, notes dot remove child notes and then note you three. Thank you. So that clears our track. Now in here, we are still going to start with uh, notes get children because we're going to reuse what we can. Then uh, we are also going to queue free what's left over. But here we're going to go and um, go through what we need to display. Okay. So um, we need our um, current note offset and um, um, and notes, I guess. Yeah, I think we're. We're sending through the notes, aren't we? Song track. Oh, we're sending off. The, we're sending through the whole track. Okay. 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 Wait. 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 
Where are you already? Where are you already? 35, 9. There's already a pair. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I think that was a track that we're getting to. That's right. We're getting the whole track here. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to loop through that. Or um, notes. Okay, um, is that then just, oops, oops, does it just work like this if I put that in int? Well, it's fine out soon enough. I think that does work. That will just count from 0 to 15. Cool. All right, and here what we're going to do is if current note plus note bigger or equal to zero then we're going to do, do something Oops, fun. Uh, because as long as that's smaller than zero we are not yet um, at the start cool Sweet. Right. Um, and actually I want that to be an int right now I want that to be float. <laughs> it's <not all. laughs> who knows? Um, all right. So here we're gonna say if we are on a positive note, cool. Um, we actually need to make sure that note is displayed. So now we want to know what type of note that is. Um, so this is going to be called track dot notes dot oh, no, current note plus note, and that obviously is now going to be of type ed track dot um, what did we call you note level. I am actually wondering if that should be uh, I'm gonna call this note level. There we go. I like that better as a name. <laughs> there we go. Why did that have to be so loud? Why is it even linked up? Okay, um, node level, that's then going to be like that. Perfect, so that should all be fine now. Um, that means that we can call that node level as well. Okay. If node type is not, it's a shame that this always needs to be completely fully uh, written out. So if it's not that we don't have a node, and note type smaller or equal to conductor dot difficulty. Okay. Then um, we are going to draw a note. So in this case, we're going to say if notes dot size bigger than zero, we're going to go and reuse our notes, else we're going to do a new note. So what we're going to do here is far um, note node, that's going to be a node 3D. In this case, it's going to be note node dot notes zero. So we're going to grab the first note um, 
from um, our list of nodes. And now we're going to say notes dot remove at zero. Cool. So we're going to basically use this as a stack of nodes that we have available to reuse. Um, and if we have no nodes left to be reused, we are going to create a, a new one. And for that, we have our node C. And let's uh, let's make this say, else if, if we have a node scene, um, then we got to go and instantiate that. No idea why there is, uh, there's new things there, but I'm sure that the default is good enough. Okay, so we get our new note, and we are going to go and add that. To there. Okay. So if we were able to successfully either reuse a note or create a note, we now have to position that note on the line. So, for that, we need to calculate our position. For our position. And that is going to start with doing um, length times note. Um, Okay, we're gonna do that. Actually, position is of course. Um, so let's start with just doing note plus offset. Actually, let's do note first because obviously we have to convert that. Uh, we can just do float note, can't we? Float note plus offset times length divided by notes. And that means that this also needs to be passed to that. All right, perfect. Which then means that our note node dot uh, position dot z. I think that becomes negative pos because we're going in the negative direction. Hey, Frost. Yeah, when you look at um, hand tracking, as in uh, visualizing where the hand is um, without using a controller, at this point in time, you use OpenXR hand um, in combination with uh, hand tracking, first of all, being enabled in your settings. Um, so... Oh, I don't have I don't have the uh, plugin installed here right now, but um, yeah. So you need to make sure that hand tracking is enabled in your settings for for the, for the quest. So in your export settings, so you go to uh, to project export, um, and then you know obviously you've got your Android export. Now we won't see it here because I don't have the plugin installed here. In here we just have the OpenXR mode here. Um, but when you tick the uh, um, the uh, Meta Quest export. Um, in 4.1, the options will be right here. In 4.2, the options will be uh, at the bottom. Um, and there should be an option there to enable hand tracking. And when that's enabled, then you can just use OpenXR hand, um, link it up to the right hand, um, and it will position that node where the hand is, and it will allow you to link it to a mesh um, with a armature so that you can actually animate the fingers. Um, there is a test project for that. If you go to Godot engine dot Godot demo project on GitHub and you go to pull requests, um, here we go. We have uh, a work in progress for a hand tracking demo. So if you, uh, if you clone, that branch on, on my GitHub repo, uh, you have an example um, hand tracking um, um, project. Now, the only thing, uh, the, the two things to keep in mind is that we're currently working on the hand interaction extension, 
Um, that is mostly working, but <coughs> um, but we're still waiting for um, that actually to be supported by various devices. Uh, that gives us an alternative. That's for uh, that's handy if you don't want to display the hand, but if you um, if you just want to use the hand as if you're holding a controller. Um, but the thing that is working here right now is with the um, uh, with displaying a hand. Now the other thing is, have I got that in here? Yeah, I'm currently using the Valve hand models here. Um, so you'll see a, a Valve glove. Do I have a screenshot in here? I might have. Actually, I think that will probably be screenshots here. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's that model that it's uh, that it's displaying. Um, the thing that is important is that that one is created for Valve. Um, when you are using hand tracking on the Quest, it will uh, it will size the skeleton to your actual hand size, and these models don't react very well. You'll see that the fingers will be pushed into the glove a bit. <coughs> so um, we're still working on. Finding slash creating meshes that uh, that are more portable between the different systems uh, by being um, able to resize themselves. <coughs> Excuse me, but the functionality is in uh, in Grow. Um, you do need to be on four point one point two or four point one point three, I think. I think earlier versions have some bugs, um, so it might not work properly there. But those are the two things that are important. So uh, first of all, having hand tracking enabled in your settings. Uh, and second is um, using the OpenXR hand and a mesh to display the hand. And it should all, uh, it should all work. So yeah, Marcus, um, it is implemented. It's just um, not very well documented at the moment. Okay, uh, where were we? Um, so we're now positioning this. We're putting that in the right place. Oops. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we're not doing anything else with this. So we are cool. Now, the other thing that I want to prepare here, um, but which we currently, of course, don't have any um, anything for, Um, last note. Actually, let's say last plate note. Um, let's actually make that minus one. Okay. Um, that means on our clear track, that's basically when we are uh, resetting anyway. Um, we therefore also want to put that. We set that back to uh, minus one because what I now want to do is if current node bigger or equal to zero and oops, current node bigger than last plate node, so we're playing a new node. So that really means that we have to make sure that we reset last node. And obviously, our last note becomes our current note. But that also means that we can say if bigger than conductor, oh, that's just uh, current note. Note that difficulty. Okay, um, so we're going to go, sorry, if we have an instrument and we have a note to play that the player isn't supposed to play, uh, we are just going to say instrument dot play, which means that obviously we need to have a, um, play function here. 
and this is just going to play at normal volume. Which does mean that we currently don't have a way to indicate in our node system um, to um, to control the volume, so that if we want to, um, uh, you know, include in our node information how uh, loud the note should be played. Um, is possibly an enhancement that we want to do. Actually, let's go and do volume DB is 0 0.0, so that we can eventually um, embed that logic in. All right, so um, we should have something working now, in theory, which also means that uh, one thing that I did wrong here is I put that on the other one, but this obviously needs to become track number one, which doesn't exist. Uh, look at that, unregister in base node. That is correct because that is another thing uh, that obviously we only want to do if we are not in the editor. We are only registering things in runtime. So let's go and put that in and that should, uh, that should remove all these beautiful um, errors. Cool. Let's go and clear that because we have plenty of nonsense here now. Okay, so shadowed track. So what have we got here? That's just the track number. Okay. Um, actually, let's go and rename this to track number. It's going to be fun because that's probably going to give me some problems here. So that's track number zero. That is now no longer track number zero, zero, one, cool. And here display track zero, zero. I'm not sure why it's giving me those. I think I need to start reloading a few things. So in display track, indeed that's no longer that. That's cool. Show notes, I actually want to go back to default as well. Okay. And now let's go back to our main scene. Oops. Um, and again in 3D. So we have this. So that's track zero. That's track one. And that means that now in our conductor, we need to use the right name as well. So that's going to be track no. And that's going to be track no. Cool. All right, have we got lots of things in place now? Okay. All right. So one thing that we uh, we haven't done anything anywhere here is obviously if the player actually plays the note and we'll uh, we'll do something with that as well um actually for that I want to go and move this to the top. So we first see if the current note is a note that we need to play. <clears throat> okay. Else if. Um. That's a good question. When do we clear it? I 
that's a good question. Um, I'm actually not going to worry about that right now. We are going to do that eventually, but not right now. Because the thing that I'm thinking about is um, if... Yeah, exactly. That's going to be the way that it is. So here we're going to check eventually that if I, as the player, hit the, <clears throat> the note at the right time, so I'm actually playing a note, at that point we're going to go and call into this. And we're going to say, like, hey, um, was there a note? Um, yep, I'm going to play that. I'm going to score it. And that's going to, you know, we're going to do an animation or something to indicate, like, yay, increase the score. And we're going to set a flag here that we have played this note. And with that um, set, we're going to skip this logic um, if the current note is the last correctly played note, basically. Um, actually, that's a really good one. Okay. Last correct note. Um, play note. So that's gonna be minus one as well. Cool. Okay, cool. All right. Hmm. So, here plays this note. Actually, I want to do it now. Check if computer plays this note. Boom. And what we want to do here, check if player played the note. Because we change our, at this point in time, we know that we're too late. So, what we're going to say here is if the last, hold on, then that obviously goes here. Um, now, actually, seeing that we do that, we're going to put that over here. Oop. Okay, so if the last plate note is not equal to the last correct plate note. And um, let's actually do this first. If the last plate note is bigger than zero, so we have a note that is in our note track. Uh, it's actually a good question that we haven't got any protection for that. So what we want to do here as well is track dot notes dot size smaller than current notes and that which means that here uh, and track dot notes dot size smaller than last played note so our last played no uh, played note is in our range of notes and our last played note is not equal to the last correct Played note, and we don't really care if it's if we played it great or if we played it wrong. Um, that's all fine. Um, okay. Um, so if we played it uh, incorrectly, and if track notes. Last played note um, is not uh, did you do? Can we put this on multiple lines? I don't know if we're, if we're allowed to do that. Are we allowed to do that? Can I do something like this? Is it going to complain about that? Um, is there a way to do that in the? Uh, 
I didn't actually know that that uh, was syntax that worked. Okay, uh, GD track dot GD. Oh, that again. <coughs> Excuse me. Track dot GD. Note level dot GD. No note. And smaller than conductor dot difficulty player should have played this right. Okay. All right. So we're not going to put that code in there yet. I'm just doing that as a um, placeholder for now. But basically, if we don't play the note on the beat, and we're going to have a little bit of leeway around here, so we need to figure out the best way to do that. Um, but then obviously we're going to uh, um, we're going to do some sort of animation. So you know, obviously at this point in time, the note will just disappear off our note line. Well, we'll instance a little block temporarily that uh, that just falls down, a little rigid body thing with the same um, mesh, um, and maybe you know we we'll play a a miss sound and we can reset some scoring and stuff like that. Uh, that's all that we are going to be doing over there. Now, that also means that when we are looking at our instrument, boom, is that we actually want to go and add a signal here. Uh, Notes played. And we're going to actually on strike, we're going to do an init signal. Now it's played. Okay. <coughs> okay, cool. So that means that, uh, let's space it out. Someone told me today that uh, it's uh, um, standard practice to put double new lines between, uh, between methods, just to uh, make uh, clear that, hey, a single new line means more instructions coming, double new line means new function coming. It makes sense. It's... Uh, uh, it's just a, uh, a standard, a, uh, it's a, a coding contention. That's the word that I was looking for. Okay. Um, so we can emit our note played. And that means, and again, we need to start setting this up as part of creating everything, is that here on our note played, we are going to go and link that up to the track that it is playing. And here we're just going to call that on note played. Um, and actually, in this case, I don't want that to be an underscore because that is something that we want to make very clear it belongs to each other. And I don't want that in the bottom. I want that to be um, up here. <coughs> okay. Um, We're also going to do something to delay this a bit because we really want to shift. Ah, well, that will we'll have a look at that. I need to figure that out. Okay, so no played. Um. Because, yeah, we really want to have a little leeway with the uh, 
with the aux fence. Because now it's really, we have to play on the beat or later. If we play it earlier, we're on an early note. So we're gonna have to do some sort of like a half beat. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. This will actually solve the problem. So we're going to do at the end here. Last offset is going to be offset. Perfect. Cool. Because what we can do here is say, um, I think that is actually the wrong name. We're gonna call this last clear played note. And therefore we're gonna do that and that, perfect. Obviously here we also want to do this last offset zero, there we go. And we're simply going to say um, if last offset smaller than 0 0.5 else, oops, we're going to be playing the next note. Okay. <coughs> All right. Okay. Um. Because here we want to tell you that if we are basically half offsets, so then we're too late to play. Servidas, so um, Godot is a game engine that we are using to build a rhythm game with. Okay. Actually, what I want to do here is bar a note. And here we're going to say, to do, um, if we've already played the good notes, not good. If we accidentally, you know, really slam the thing as much as we can, then we obviously don't want to do that. Um, and actually, the other thing is, it's not the note that we're playing. It's really the beat that we're doing. Yeah, same old, same old. Um, okay. So if our last played note is, now here we're going. Hmm. Yeah, 
so this actually goes here. I'm going to change the way this works. So check if the player played um, our note. So in this case, we're actually not going to do last player note. We are going to check if the current note is bigger than that, and if it's within that, if it should be played. Um, and whether that is the note that we've played, but here we now add in um, and last offset is smaller than zero and um, current offset, oops, sorry, smaller than half and current offset is more than half. So basically in the current note, if we don't play it within the first half of the beat, we're too late. But with this check over here, um, we are checking that if we are on the previous note, but in the last half of the offset, um, and this is, yeah, then we're we're saying that that's the one that we played. Okay, that's cool. Um, so here we need to add a check at some point that if we are hitting it uh, and it's not already played, then not good. Uh, but the other check that we really want to do in here uh, to do, Check if we're playing a note we're not supposed to play. Um, oh, we're still doing something wrong here. And that. Why does it not like that? Back new line. So there's a space there. Woo so, um, and again, I'm just doing this as placeholder stuff. Um, I'm probably going to improve the way that, uh, that we're going to treat uh, to keep track of. Um, whether the player should be playing a note. Um, actually, we could probably, hold on, that's probably a good idea. Um, So here we're just checking if it's a player note that we're playing. Cool. Are we only using that here? Then actually I want to do um I'm just gonna put that here and this is last computer played note. No, that's not actually what it is. No, I actually want to go and rename this. So this is going to be called last beat. Last beat plus one. Um, there we go. Last beat, last beat. Okay, then I actually want to call this current beat. There we go. Current beat, current beat, current beat, current beat. Oops. Um, current beat, current beat, current beat, current beat. Um, mm -hmm. Because the thing is, Why is that not working all of a sudden? Do we have errors in this? Did not parse global class, DVD display chart, okay. <laughs> oh, you're not gonna tell me that we have a um
Yeah, because I cannot parse this because it cannot say what the This is so bloody annoying. <laughs> because in conductor, I now have said that I'm using display track. It needs to first compile the display track thing, and it can't do that because I am doing that. Okay, so the, <clears throat> the way around that is call. Okay, I need to do it on there. Okay, so that becomes conductor call. Um, yeah, well. And now it's happy because now it can compile that because it can use this by track because we no longer have a round robin issue. Ooh, that is uh, crazy. I thought we uh, we had put proper checks in that. Okay. Um, <coughs> at least now it reads better, but um, Actually want this in front of here so that's what we do here here do uh, um, update create notes to go boom and remove the lines over okay cool now we save the last offset okay so um updating a track we have here and I'm actually going to change the way that works but we'll do that later because what I really want is that the moment that the offset um, takes over that's probably a better way to do it yes um, Okay, so we're going to change the way that this works. Um, I'm just going to go and comment this all out and do a pass because I'm going to change this in a minute. Um, player should uh, play notes. Um, and here we can now do uh, track dot gd. Uh, what is it called? Why can't I remember what it's called? Gd note level. Why is that not? What am I doing wrong? Gd track gd note level. That's what it should be. Yes, gd track dot dot. No note. Perfect. Okay, so we're just going to go and keep changing that. All right, so, and we're actually going to do that. Um, so let's go and reset you. Boom. Where are we? Where are we? Here. Boom. Okay, so we're playing no notes. Cool. Right. Um, and then here, what we're actually going to be doing, uh, check if player uh, should play a new note. 
what we're going to do here is we're going to say if last offset smaller than five and a current offset is bigger than five so if we've gone over that threshold then we're going to do some logic so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to check if is not no note so if we should have played a note um player wasn't in time um the um score and that's going to be a to do so we're going to go and do that in the near future cool add that in the near future um the next thing that we're going to do here is that we're going to determine what the new note is um that we should play that also means that seeing that we do all that there i'm going to move this up so that everything is nicely together um so yeah okay so here we do now um so now we can go and copy a, a bunch of things from here so we don't have to reinvent the wheel there okay um okay so this is actually going to be um if current beat plus one so did we did we do that? Hold on. Yeah, we removed the display. So if our current beat plus one is bigger than zero and current beat plus one is smaller than notes, we don't care you. We've already checked you. And here we're simply going to say um, if we have a note to play and the note is smaller. Okay, that's the other thing that's wrong. This needs to be smaller or equal than we play it. Yeah, and that is there. So again, if it's smaller, okay, so almost we got that wrong. Um, should play this note next. Cool. So now we can say uh, player should play note is that next note. And that gives us half a beat before the um the note until half a beat after the note for the player to play it and obviously the further away that they are of that offset the um um the worse that score i guess okay so now we can go and make this better and what we're going to do here is if no if we shouldn't play a note um to do um we shouldn't have the score so obviously we need to do something there Player hit notes at the score. What's that? Um, and play the animation or something. So obviously we need to do something to make it clear that uh, yay, we've done something good. Um, and in this case, we now say we know we don't want to play this note twice so we're going to now set it to no note now the nice thing about this is that if i hit the note on time there we go. if i hit the note on time and obviously i get my score here that's something that we need to still build and uh, this now gets set to no note so that when our offset picks over this should now be no note, so we don't get our lose score for not hitting the, time, uh, the note in time. So we now have the base logic in place, both to 
detect when a player plays a note they shouldn't play or when they've missed the note. So that is obviously uh, the thing that we need to um, start doing things with. Now we've got a whole bunch of code that we wrote and we have no idea if everything works. Now, um, the other thing that I suddenly realized is that I hooked up that guy, but I haven't hooked up this guy yet. Uh, so note played. Um, that now is gonna go on you. Okay, I had hoped that with advanced we could see what uh, um, what methods we had. Oh, what are oh, we have a pick <laughs> on no blade. Very good. I knew there had to be a button for that. Um, so obviously that now does both, but this track is linked to that tom, and this track is linked to that tom. We've only got notes for that one. That one won't be doing anything, which is cool. Um, so yeah. That is now all working. Okay. Now, just for testing, before we actually start playing this and, and find out all the mistakes that I've made, because that's of course what happens when you write this much without testing anything in between. Uh, but for debugging purposes, I actually want to add a label 3D. I'm just going to call that debug. And we're going to go move you up. And we're going to say um, text. No notes. I want to go and put that a bit more up. I want to put that a bit more backwards. Maybe even a bit more up. Just so that it's out of the way, but we can read it. That's going to tell us what we should be playing um, or what the um, what the current note is that we're playing. So what we're going to be doing with that is um, let's call it debugging. Um, I should probably use a match for this, but why does that? I don't get why that auto completion doesn't work. No, no, it's. <clears throat> um, so that's going to be easy. No, it's just going to be that in easy out. <coughs> ah, maybe that's why the auto completion wasn't working because I keep making typos. Very good. Uh, normal mode. Actually, let's just do, let's save some space here. And that needs to be in capitals. Thank you very much. Let's call that normal. And finally, we have hard. Now, obviously, we've got uh, easy mode selected, so we will only see easy. All right, let's see how much mistakes we've made. Let's go and run this and see what happens. Okay, there we go. Uh, unable to iterate an object type nil, show notes. Oh, because I haven't renamed you, very good. Yeah. And that obviously, no, that's what? Great. Um, okay, so that is because that should be range after all. There we go. That's why I got it wrong. Okay. Convert range from the. Why is that nil? Show notes. I bet you that's because we renamed that and it's probably, so that one's good, but it's probably bad here. Well, it was saying eight, so 
I don't know. Is it happy now? Almost. So I'm going to be here now. Linux is float. Um, float from int. What are you talking about? Node 15. Notes. Oh, no notes. Public junior. Again there. Well, what did I say about uh, doing so much coding and uh, it always, of course, going wrong there? Okay. Um, oh, what did I do wrong here? Uh, oh, because that needs to be an assign. All right, there we go. Uh, continue. Okay, so far so good. Let's see where we get with this. Okie dokie. Ooh, point. Well, we can see the notes coming. Uh, but it doesn't say what we're supposed to do, which is interesting. Ding, ding, ding. Now, the other thing is that it's going very choppy. And that is likely because our offset thing isn't working the way that it should. So, what am I doing wrong here? I get time. So our beat becomes time divided by 60 times uh, beats per minute. So this is in seconds. Um, yeah, so divided by 60, we get it in minutes times beats per minute. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Out, beat. That should then be the remainder. It should go from zero to one. Um, I actually want to go. I'm going to take that out and instead, there we are, that's fine. Okay, so here we're going to say convector plane is true. And we're going to put it back to false. We need to do uh, a little bit more here, but that should do that. Um, I don't think so, because that means that if one second passes, we uh, we say that it's a minute. Um, because actually, it's sort of the opposite way of reading this is that we actually say songs, now beats per minute, divided by 60 gives us beats per second. So times of time in seconds gives us which beat we're on. And it did move at you know, seemingly um, the correct speed. It was just that, the, that the, the offset didn't seem to work the way that I am expecting it to work. Um, You know what? I'm just going to do this. Print. Um,
So let's add time in there as well. Fine. Um, All right. So I really should be displaying that on screen somewhere, but okay, we do have those guys going. But the weird thing is that. Ah, that command us. Um, sorry, that needs to then be like this. Okay, so still um, sort of. Well, the time looks fine, but okay. So now, now I need to redo that. Just clear that out. Play. So what are we doing here? That actually looks pretty good. So we start with zero, we slowly increase, 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 increase. So um, but the other thing that we saw was that we're actually not, um, we're displaying our nodes way further than our track length. So we're definitely calculating this wrong. Ah, that might be our mistake. Okay, this is interesting because they go back. <laughs> okay, I think I have an idea why that mm -hmm. is. Oh, that's just my that one was wrong. So I have that note. That's offsets. Should probably be like this then. Ah, now they're coming in nicely. One, two, three, four, play. Okay. Cool. Okay, that's kind of working. But we're not seeing so okay so um, that bit works. I'm happy about that. Our positioning now works. Um, but our logic for knowing which notes to play wasn't doing what it's supposed to do. Okay. Okay. Swollen, um, clear track, class to offset is zero. Do we have um, yep, that's there. Oh, here. Mm, yeah, clear track is become zero. Oh, good. Let's do this. New note to play. Okay, so let's say this new beat is current beat plus one, just so that we can do something with that. Um, to be between the signs. If it's not equal to no note, if it's small or equal to difficulty. Okay. Player should play. Let's see if this even gets assigned. 
Okay. Um, Okay, computer plays. Um, let's for that go into our song. Um, and again, this is just for testing, so it really doesn't matter whether it makes sense or not. But we're going to put this on normal. Well, actually, not that one. We're going to put this one on normal. Go down this one on normal. So every other beat, we. Uh, we have the computer play in uh, a note. Let's see if that works. So it's only, obviously only for the first couple. So we still have silence at the moment. That one. Okay, so even our computer doesn't play. Interesting. Okay, we do have a new, okay, so a new note to play works. Three F. Three F. I want to see if this works properly. Last object. That's okay. Um, and I make the mistake. Mistake again, of course. That needs to be an array to make that print work. Okay. Um, I'll do a print here. Here, I just want to go and say new beats space. Um, back notes size. Let's see if there's something wrong with that. It shouldn't be, but you don't know. Let's just see what it outputs. Okay, that's right. We're going to go. Okay. So now we're suddenly positive. That looks good too. So perfect. Okay. No, oh, I'm so dumb. <laughs> if the new beat falls in there, that's probably the same thing that we're doing here. So here I actually want to, here we go, same thing. There we go. Actually never changes until we hit zero, that's fine. Um, let's see if that already fixes our problem. Okay, but it doesn't go back to... Okay, so we have a reset that we're forgetting. And that is because here we need an else. Okay. Okay, we go here. We now know that all works. We don't need you, we don't need you. Thank you. Okay. So if I miss it, 
Oh, I'm not. This is the thing that I don't like is I have my desk in the way. Um, I already see that I'm double hitting it, so I need to do something about that. Kind of bounces off. So I need to make sure that that stops. Um, that's definitely something that needs to be fixed on the on the instrument side, but that's fine. Okay. Okay, so we're detecting correctly. So what I want to do now, that we're happy with. So let's just do here debug. Here we do um, double, and here just to see if it works. We just change the text on our thingy. Right, this time I am going to go <clears throat> sit a bit further. See, it goes to double missed. Why is it? Why am I hitting a double? That doesn't make sense. Good. Good. No, no, we can double. Okay, so we want to add in a bounce protect on our instrument itself because that is just uh, not fair. Is that just a. Okay. Um, cool. All right. Um, I'm actually going to go and take these out again. Oh, shit, I did the wrong way around. Um, <laughs> the easy notes are the ones that I wanted to keep. Uh, easy note, one, two, three. Easy note, no note, one, two, three, four. Easy note, no note, one, two, three. Easy note, no note. So we're back at just playing the notes that the player needs to play for, uh, for two of these, perfect. Um, what I want to do now is I want to go and um, I want to go and move that over here. I'm still going to do that on that, but this one is actually going to be um, is that our, no. Thank you. Crash. I want to go and put that on our crash symbol. I'm not sure if that's the right. I just wanted a doom, 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 doom. Um, that's going to be track two. That also means that uh, we need to unhook this signal. Oops. And instead on our crash, we're going to go and say that gets linked to track number two. Notes played. Connect. Boom. Perfect. And now we're going to go back in to our test song. We're now going to say we have two tracks. So here we're going to get a new CD track. Uh, OK, we need to rename that. That's a typo. Um, let's go and save. Boom. Um, let's go into our track. Let's go and rename. Let's actually go and. Because it's going to have fun with that, of course. Um, let's go save. Let's go and rename that instrument. Thank you very much. Um, I should have already done this. Okay. 
do that and lots that. So here we can now say that was <coughs> um, that was our Tom. And then for this one, we're going to say that is our No, this was a crash. Where is a crash? Crash symbol. Cool. Uh, let's make this one 160 as well. So the both the same uh, ones. And here we're going to go on the off. So there we go. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Cool. So just the first two groups we're going to do again. Um, all right. So we've got that. Now in our instrument, um, do we do that here or do we do that? On our actual, is that our hand scripts? I think so. Almost 12, okay. Let's see if we can get this double hitting out of here. And then I think we, uh, we're there. Okay, um, target, motion. Uh, so hits, not hitting anything. Is not last hit object. Or hit object on for that. Then we do that, but that, that. And we strike it. Last hit object is hit object. Okay. Um, no, I think I'm going to put it in here for now. Um, Git say timer. There we go. That's going to be a one shot. So that is going to be probably going to be have to be much less than that. One second. Um, there we go. So we let's say we have 160 beats a second. Um, That's 60, so that, or sorry, per minute. So that means, uh, let's say two and a half. So one divided by 2.5. Okay, so one point sec, one second would be probably enough. Okay, so timeout, on the late timer, timeout, boom. Um, so here it is going to be our can strike. And here we're gonna say if and strike boom 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 boom. False false and delay timer start. There we go. Let's see if that is enough to uh, to stop it from uh, from the, the double hits. Okay. <clears throat> Oh. oh, I'm too close to my bloody table again. Okay, so even though that's now not doing double, I'm still getting the 
double there. That's interesting. Uh, also, my text needs to be a little bit smaller because that is too much. Um, hmm. Okay, so there's a few things that I want to do. The first thing is that I actually want my play line to be a little lower. So that we have a bit better sight on it, on what's coming. Um, see if that works good enough. I also think that these guys need to be longer. Um, and I'm actually going to change it over here. So let's, uh, let's see if it does that or if that, yeah, that's good. That's good. Perfect. Um, so we've got a bit more space there. That's cool. Um, but now, why do we get double? Actually, um, that now comes even if we, uh, I'm going to go all that wrong. Why does it do that? Don't do that. There we go. Because that's not just when it's double, that's also happening if we're not supposed to play a note. Okay. So I might just be playing it at the wrong time. Okie dokie. Um... Uh, the other thing that of course that I said that I would have to do was make that smaller. There we go. Now it shouldn't overwrite each other. Yeah. Okay, now what's happening, guys? Why is this now not tracking properly? Okay, so I keep doing them wrong. So we're somehow wrongly timed. Um, that's good enough. <laughs> Putting my uh, thing right on there. <clears throat> Let's get rid of a few more things in here. Mm, okay, what am I doing wrong here? So looking at the current beats, I think. Um, Okay, let's just, uh, oops, uh, come on, don't do that. Put my finger on the wrong buttons. Okay, um, I know that this is going to disable a few things. But, because obviously we're not going to see our mist right now. Oh, and that needs to be that just a bit more. Okay. But I just want to see what that does. Okay, so no note. And uh, yeah, we need to put that a bit further away. Note, note. So no note is gone before we hit that. That makes no sense. Let's so just do a second one. Um, don't really care where that is. I'm just going to put that over here. I'm going to say debug 
to text is beat the um, offset. Let's just be okay. And beat. Okay. Actually, that's no, I don't want that. I need two lines. Is that I need to make that a bit higher? Hopefully, that's not too high. What am I? What am I overlooking? Offset. That is the thing that I'm doing wrong. Yeah, I know you're lying in the wrong place. Okay. Drink. Drink. Yeah, I think that was my mistake because by adding that one, I actually this is annoying. I, I keep putting my my controller exactly where the drum is there. Let's put it out of there. Okay, so I'm gonna take this out. There we go. Um, I'm gonna take this out again. I really do want to keep that, but I want to move that somewhere else. So now we got our myth. Um okay, we got our player. Okay, so what I also want to do here now is our player hit note. Uh, bull is false. And we're going to say here, uh, not here, uh, where's this guy? Here we go. So. And then here we're saying, okay, when we have a new note, um, we're going to say, no, you haven't hit it. Boom. Uh, it's very different. You know, JavaScript has its you know, it's usages and it has easy bits and has hard bits. It's the same as sh shaders are difficult. That's what it comes boils down to. Um, okay, what am I doing now? So, um, so what I want to do here right now is.
I'm going to do this differently. I'm not going to make this a bool. I'm going to make this an int. And I'm actually going to make that minus one, uh, which means that this um, oh, that's all out of the way. Um, no, it's actually it's got to be bool. Bad. Yeah, and I'm going to change this one. Um, and that one becomes minus one. Uh, player sheet one. I'm going to name that player sheet uh, play B. That makes it also easier to find everything that I need to ch change it. But here we're going to say if it's minus one, that means that we aren't supposed to play anything. Here we're going to make it minus one. No, that also won't work. Dang it. I think I need an extra I need an extra variable. Uh for player beats. I'm actually just gonna call that uh minus one. There we go. Don't care about that, don't care about that, because that's just true. Then here. Um, we're going to say player beat is new beat. Gotta remember which one it is. Cool. Then in this case, we can put this back to minus one. We don't really care much more about that. Um, we're probably going to do that minus one. And we're going to go and say minus one. What did I just mess up? Run out. Oh, because I hit save without the control. Um, okay, so now what I can do finally is if player hit note and current beat plus note is player beat. So then we no longer show it there. Cool. Cool. Okay. So I think I need a bigger delay. Well, why is it why not? <laughs> I went too early tonight. Mm. <laughs> okay, so I'm getting there. <laughs> oh, that's not the first one there. <clears throat> All right, so um, one thing that I want to do is actually move this a bit more back. Oops, not that guy. Okay. So that we can actually see it because right now it's too hidden and again eventually we'll make the um we make it much clearer that we need to hit something um maybe because i'm not and i do do only standalone for rxr um Cyber, I think your 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 um <laughs> your your message is a little bit out of order, but I'm assuming that you mean does Godot support standalone headsets that are not using Android? I am currently not aware of any standalone headsets um that do not run on Android. Except for the, uh, there's like an open source one that runs, I think, on Linux. But in, if if it runs on Linux and it has OpenXR support, then Godot should support it. So, um,
but yeah, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not aware, nor do I have access to any standalone VR headsets that don't run on Android. So don't know. Um, it will be interesting to see if uh, if there are any out there and whether they are having problems with uh, with Godot. So ah, stupid tangent thing keeps going up. I hope that that's fixed. So. Um, all right, so we've got those two. We just have got those things in there. I'm wary of the time. The thing is, I uh, I wanted to sort of do something when you hit and when you uh, when you miss. So obviously, when you when you miss, I actually want um, the little block to just fall off. Um, And if I, if you hit, you know, we're already making it disappear, but I want to do some sort of animation. Um, but I think we're running out of time. Oh, okay, sorry, I missed uh, Servida's message. Um, Uh, yeah, it does need to be exported with a template. That's part of Godot. So you go to uh, to editor and manage export templates. You can install the templates. Um, what is the base size of it? The Android template is only uh, only 19 KB zip, so it's pretty small. Because uh, obviously the EXE is big. So that's 130. Max, but that's the whole editor. But the um, um, the Android source isn't so. I'm not sure why you say that it's 80 megs, um, but a a simple Godot game exported to an Android APK shouldn't be that big, I would reckon, unless there's something that I'm overlooking in that. Um, and that's even a debug APK. So that's our standard APK that we do. So yeah, I'm not sure uh, where where the 80 megabytes come from. Um. It's important that if if you have a quest and and because right now you know I'm running on the index, but I'm running everything in PC VR mode. So Godot just runs on the PC, and the signal is is being sent to the headset. And and before when I was playing around with the quest, I did the same thing. Uh, but if you set up the export correctly for um, for running natively on quest. Um, then uh, you actually deploy it as an APK to the device. And you don't need to be on Windows for that. You do need to have Android Studio because we use parts of Android Studio for that. Um, but for instance, if you're on a Mac or a Linux machine, you should be able to develop for Quest and then just push it out to a Quest. Um, and the installation on the Quest should be pretty small, or well, the base installation. Obviously, if you've got a lot of graphics in your game, it starts blowing up. Or if you've got a lot of uh, meshes, then it starts blowing up in size. Okay. Um, guys, I think I'm, as far as the development side of everything goes, I'm going to leave it there tonight because I'm getting tired. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm starting to uh, not think that straight anymore. However, I think we have done a lot of work tonight. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have the basic track logic working. We have detection of whether we are hitting the drum on the beats. Um, we detect when we miss. We detect when we hit when we shouldn't. There's obviously now stuff that we need to build to visually indicate that we need to do that. Um, we have the start of our song structure. So um, we can define all our tracks, show the beats that we have. We have a start of our difficulty level system. Um, obviously, uh, right now, you know, we go in and we immediately start playing the song. That's stuff that needs to uh, 
um, that needs to start. Um, hold on, let me just double check what player. Yes, for Android headsets, cross Pico, you need Android to export to it. That's correct. Um, Yeah, and it, in, in the end, you need a computer to work on. And unfortunately, the one thing that we can't do yet, um, and maybe that's what you're asking, um, Godot can run on an Android tablet. So you can develop Godot games on an Android tablet. However, you can't develop VR games on an Android tablet because we don't have a way to then deploy that game um, to the quest and we don't have a way to install the components that you need in order to um to deploy on quest so you have to have a pc running windows or linux or you have to have a a mac uh, so a macbook uh, can even be a macbook air um but you need uh you know a, a normal desktop computer in order to run godot and in order to install android studio and to install the components that you need to run, um, you know, to run the quest. Um, that said, uh, this is going to be fun uh, on stream looking at my own channel. Um, so if you go to videos, you'll see, and it's it's a little bit older. I need to I need to make some new ones. Uh, but you see the getting started with OpenXR. That's for PC VR. And then there's a getting started with the Pico 4. And the instructions in this video are nearly identical if you are on the quest. Um, I think on this video, there, there is part of the quest information at the end. But I will be making a new video soon um, that is updated because there's a couple of changes coming in 4.2. Um, so there will be a new video out, um, uh, hopefully before our game jam. Um, where I go through the whole process again of setting up a um, an OpenXR project in Godot 4.2, and then go through the process of how you export that to the Quest, to Pico, or any of the other devices, now that we have that system more um, in place. So that is coming. Um, <coughs> yeah, while we're here, uh, just a reminder, uh, we talked about it at the beginning of the stream, but for people who weren't there at the beginning, we have a game jam that we're organizing in two weeks. So um, um, we'll see how it goes. We have 53 people already signed up to, to, uh, to participate. So it's going to be very interesting to see what people come up with. Um, so basically any, any game that you make um, with Godot in XR, you can, you can submit. Um, in, in the coming two weeks before this starts, both myself and Malcolm, uh, who are, by the way, organizing this, uh, this game jam, uh, note also that uh, links to our YouTube channels are in this description. Um, we do plan to put some more content online uh, to help people. Um, the other thing which is really important for people who are not aware of that is we have a repo uh, in on GitHub called Godot VR. We actually still need to rename that to Godot XR. Um, and on this uh, repo, you'll find a whole bunch of things. Uh, one is XR Tools, which is our toolkit that we use. Um, that is uh, also published to the asset library, uh, but this is where you find the source. But more possibly more interesting is this project called Godot XR Template, uh, which we also plan to uh, uh, to put a version on the asset library as a, as a template that you can install at the start. Um, right now, the 4.1 version is, is there for, uh, for 4.0 and 4.1, but there's going to be, again, a new version for 4.2. Um, but the nice thing about this is it is a, um, a template project that has uh, XR tools already installed. It has your uh, all your Android set up there. Um, it contains uh, a mini game, um, just a, a couple of very simple scenes. Um, and basically when you, when you download this, you have a running template into which you can you know, build your own thing. So that's a nice little uh, getting started um, thing. Um, 
yeah, so those are sort of the things that we um, uh, we have. There's, there's more coming. I actually need to um, complete the handy links thing. Um, obviously, like I said, we have the links to our YouTube channels. I also have a link here to uh, to David Snowpack's channel where there is a lot of information about WebXR. Um, I'm planning to add another link here, if I don't forget, tomorrow um, to a, uh, a rival XR tools library, but written in C-sharp. So for someone who wants to get started in C-sharp, we have, there is a uh, an alternative tool set, um, which is actually quite nice. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of things that um, that are available to really quickly set up uh, an XR game and participate in the game jam. So I hope that lots of people do. <clears throat> yeah, Frost, that's the um that's the, the thing that is a shame when it comes to meta. Um a long, long time ago Oculus wanted to run everything on uh, on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And at some point in time they decided that that was just too much work. And I can kind of get that because there's a whole bunch of issues with maintaining multiple platforms. Um and they decided to completely focus on on Windows. So uh, their major tool set is is very Windows oriented. They're doing more on Mac nowadays, so there are some interesting thing uh, things um, that um, you know, that are becoming available, but nothing like the uh, the Windows experience. So the fact that on Windows you can just start the Oculus client and use your uh, your Crest and PC VR mode. Um, that's not really available on the other platforms through Meta themselves. Well, like Cyber says, um, you can use tools like um, uh, what's something called ALVR, um, but um, that is obviously a third-party uh, solution, and uh, I don't have any personal experience with it. I have heard from a lot of people uh, who do use it and who uh, who swear by it, so it's obviously a good product. Uh, but I don't know how hard or easy it is to set up. So uh, I will defer to Cyber's uh, remarks on that. Uh, Servita, yeah, Godot is 100% completely free. Uh, we have an editor version that runs on Android tablets, but that's only for normal game development. Uh, you, you cannot use that currently for uh, developing VR games. There are a few things um, that are being tried, and if they work, who knows? The, the, they might, uh, there might be an option there. Um, but right now for VR development, you really do need a normal PC. But Godot itself is 100% free. So um, you don't have to pay anyone. Obviously, um, the, the footnote there is um, if there are, um, things to be paid to wherever you deploy. So I think Meta doesn't charge anything for you to put your game on uh, on App Lab. I think that's completely free as well. It's unlike Apple, where you need to pay your $100 a month if you want to put, uh, put something on the Apple Store. Um, I don't know about the Meta Store. I think in the Meta Store, it's also free to put your, your game on there, but you have to get, go through a... Uh, a rigorous uh, process with Meta because they uh, they want to veto and manage everything that is installed on their uh, or is available on their store. Of course, uh, you do have to uh, pay your percentage of your game to Meta uh, if you um, uh, if you end up putting your game on their store. Uh, but from from the Godot side, we don't charge anything. We uh, we're completely free. Uh, you can do whatever you want with the uh, the game engine. The only thing that uh, um, that we ask is that somewhere in your game uh, you include a bit of license text, and that is just to give recognition. It's like an attribution thing, um, so that uh, people know that your uh, um, your game is used by or is, is created using Godot. Um, 
that's really the only requirement Godot has. Uh, there are a couple of third-party libraries that Godot uses that has the same requirements. So the, the license text is you know, a bit of Godot text and a bit of license text for other uh, components. But again, it's just attribution. It's just to let people know that it uses those things. Excuse me, that was my throat. Ah. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> I'm still having some throat problems, so uh, my voice is going out, I think. Um, no, 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 it's good. I'm, I'm basically, uh, I'm done for, uh, for today anyway with developing. I think that... Uh, we have done more than enough. Um, I need to slowly round things up anyway, so I always like to just chat a little bit before I call it a day. Um, just to see if anybody has questions or if anybody has got uh, remarks. Hey, enough. Uh, I was just talking about uh, some of the stuff that you uh, were doing as in C Sharp uh, Toolkit. So, um, yeah, did you actually sign up for the for the game, Jim? Are you gonna gonna participate with something? That would be really cool. Uh, everybody else, Nub is a very uh, cool uh, Godot XR developer who is working on some really amazing stuff, including a, a really cool gunslinger game. So, um, yeah, very excited stuff that he's doing. Um, what was I saying? Um, so yeah, now like I was saying, at the end of my streams, I always just like to you know, just chat a little bit, answer some questions, get some feedback from uh, from uh, the stream. So uh, no problem at all asking about uh, about Godot and, and what the capabilities are. Um, as far as what we've done today, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with the progress that we've made so far. Um, so yeah. We'll see what we uh, what we do next week. I am going to uh, try and do another stream uh, next Friday again. But the Friday after that, obviously, it's game jam time. So I will probably, um, well, if I stream, it will be about the game jam. It will not be um, um, developing anything. Um, I'm not planning to make something for the game jam uh, itself, simply because I'll be way too busy helping people who are participating in the game jam so um so yeah um what else do we want to mention before we call it a night because it is uh it is half past 12 already um let me think what else is interesting to talk about here because I think we're getting very close to a point where we have all the base functionality in here. So I think next week we all just finish off the logic around the tracks and see uh, um, see how we react to uh, to when the player hits the drums at the right time, so, uh, react properly to uh, to um, uh, when they don't. Um, I also want to do some effects on the drums itself. So when you hit the drum, that there's some some effects going, just to sort of you know create a little bit of um, um, interaction with what you're doing. Um, and then I think the the challenge is going to be to find some music to use, and um, that I think is the the difficult part because. We basically, when we look at music, we need something that has a drum track that where we can remove the drum track so that we can replace the drum track by actually, because this is almost a mod tracker that we're creating in some ways. And, and that was one of the things that I'm actually thinking about is actually looking at uh, some of the mod trackers or, or music format that actually have, plays the music on track formats. Um, where I can then say, hey, these are tracks that the computer plays, these are tracks that actually have instruments, and we actually play the music um, as meant. Um, the other thing that I need to think of is whether we want volume control um, or even you know more uh, more control about how the the note is played. Because of course, in, in, in our case here, that's the nice thing about doing a drum game is that every drum just has a fixed sound. The only thing that we really control 
with the drum is volume. Now with a real drum, obviously you have a little bit more because like for instance, a hi-hat, you hit the hi-hat, you can actually put your hand on it to stop the sound, stuff like that. Um, I think I will not go that far if, if we need uh, that sort of stuff. Um, that will just have to be in the main song. Hey, Joanna. Ah, well, you know, uh, then you are way ahead of me because uh, I have never even, well, I've, I've played a drum, but not as play played a drum. I've just hit drums. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, any insight that you can provide or if you uh, if you can help out with uh, with maybe uh, um, a song that we can that we can program into this, um, that would be really cool. Yeah, um, actually, MIDI is probably a good idea to have a look at uh, at using a MIDI format yeah, that that we can import into this. So that uh, that would be really cool. So yeah, any sort of help like that would be uh, would be really cool. Um, and and again, you know, right now I'm doing it all manually in 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 the the, 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 the idea, of course, in the long run, if I really get that far. Is that we have some sort of compositor inside of um, this? Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about is doing like a free play, uh, where there is no timeline, but you can just uh, play the drums and uh, and maybe even record, and then you know have an editor where you can clean up the notes. Um, so yeah, that's 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 where I want to go to. Uh, but having uh, something that is actually playable, and especially something that has you know. The drums we play and the uh, uh, the non drums is just a, a normal audio track. Um, actually, that's a good question. Do we actually have a MIDI track in here? No, we just have MP3 and, and AUG. So that is something that I would then have to create outside of uh, of Godot. But that's all right. So that should be pretty straightforward. So yeah, that's uh, that's where we're going. We're, we're we're still you know very early on. We're, that, that's going to take way more time before we get to a point where. Uh, um, you know, where we could do some sort of editor and um, uh, make sure that people can make their own songs. Um, I do not know of a MIDI plugin for Godot. Um, it also depends a little bit on whether you want to play MIDI files or whether you want to use MIDI as an input or whether you want to use MIDI as an output. Um, but... Ah, Rod, yeah, cool. I, I wasn't aware that me that we could do MIDI inputs. So that is quite cool. Ah, Cyber, very cool. You know, it's, uh, it, it's yeah, I, I still think that I'm crazy for doing this because like I said, way in the beginning and also on my stream last week when, when I started this project is I'm as amusical as it gets. Um, in a, in a, in a another lifetime many many years ago i learned how to play uh, the piano and i have long since forgotten how that is um uh, and in that respect i'm also incredibly uh, happy and and surprised that my children uh, both play instruments and are a hundred times better than i am um but yeah i'm a musical as it gets and and i'm and i'm making a drum game uh, <laughs> So it called me crazy, but um, uh, for me, the hope with this project is is to create something um, that, first of all, through the streams, show people how you could do something like that from a programming point of view, um, but also that I hope that this does grow into something. Um, you know, once we actually replace you know all the the cylinders and boxes with actual proper uh, meshes, and I'm still not sure what style I wanted to go there. Uh, we obviously want to have a nice background so that it all looks nicer. Um, the hope uh, is to create the, or just turn this into a, a really good demo game for Godot uh, to basically show that Godot can be used to create a really cool rhythm game uh, on VR. Definitely the uh, the end goal is for this to run uh, smoothly on a Quest. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do source-wise, whether I'm fully going to open source this or do something else. Probably I will. Um, but I want to get to a point where it's actually 
uh, good enough to share. So, uh, but until now, you know, uh, I'm doing this live on stream, so anybody can fo follow along and copy what I'm doing. So, um, so yeah. All right, input meter vector. Okay, I didn't even uh, even know that we had that. That's really cool. Um, Hmm, so Giovanna, you want the MIDI not to be played by Godot, but you want Godot to output it through MIDI and then have a MIDI device attached play the song. That's kind of very um, specific because, you know, if someone downloads your, your game, they might not have access to hook it up to... Uh, to the synth, so I would I would assume that it makes more sense when you have a MIDI file that you could have Godot play the MIDI file. Yeah, the input MIDI event that I can I can see that uh, that being interesting. Um, you know, it, it is in this case that I'm making a a VR rhythm game. You know, if this would be a desktop rhythm game, it would be cool if uh, instead of uh, doing it on your keyboard, you could actually uh, hook up a um, uh, you know a, a digital drum set uh, over MIDI <laughs> and then play the game. But I think for VR, you know, the whole point, of course, is having the actual drum set in VR. Although one of the things that I found really interesting. Um, um, is that the number of people are using the quest in pass-through mode where they are playing an instrument live, so on a, a keyboard or whatever, and but they are overlaying what they need to play through the pass-through, which is kind of cool. All right, so yeah, then it makes sense to have MIDI output as well. <clears throat> oh yeah, exactly. What uh, so so that you know obviously, um, the whole idea here is to use the drum set in game because uh, we can you know uh, this is modeled after a quote unquote real drum set, um, but my idea here is that. We're in a in a virtual space, so the drums don't actually have to be laid out. You know, we could have drums that are are to your side or or on the top, or you know, it might not even be a drum uh, itself. The point of this rhythm game is that we have instruments that we need to strike, um, and whether you know um, the the shape of it doesn't really matter. So we can do some really crazy things with it. Um, all that matters is that we have a way to to let the player know that they need to hit a certain instrument and even with the tracks right now that we are now having them here you know this is already unclear whether this track here goes to the uh the crash or whether it goes to the uh to the floor tom um so that's obviously things that i still need to improve here that um and maybe even i'm not even going to have these tracks come out of this line but the track might eventually start at the instrument the track is for. Uh, and again, that is one of the reasons why I wanted this to be a separate scene that just works independent of anything else. I can place it anywhere in my scene and um, we'll figure out later on what works. And you know, maybe even instead of the little uh, blocks that I'm now putting on there, we might have little um, mini versions of the instrument. So we'll have you know, uh, little symbols coming down here, like, you know, little round thingies. And we have tiny little drums going down here. We might not even have the uh, the line there. That's just now for uh, for a placeholder. Um, as long as the player has a clear indication of they need to hit this thing when a certain point on that line is reached, um, then we have a rhythm game working. Well, that's the other thing indeed is that, well, you know, when you when you look at uh, digital drum sets, um, they're neighbor friendly as well because you can just play them with um, uh, with your headset on. But yeah, compared to a real drum, I think if I put a real drum set in my house that uh, my neighbors will chase me away very, very quickly, especially seeing that I can't play. The... Uh, 
there is actually a music sequencer on Godot. Um, it's been a while since I looked at it. Let's see if I can find it. Is it this one? It's all over here. Well, I'm sure YouTube doesn't mind commercial on YouTube. Uh, hey, look at this. Hi. Hey, Matty Wolf, how are you going? I'm afraid you're, uh, uh, you got here at the end of the stream. I'm, uh, I'm but, uh, but hey, cool. Um, loving your videos, man. Uh, really cool to see that you're uh, you're getting into Godot and you're trying out Godot VR. Um, and uh, yeah, um, welcome to our community, mate. It's uh, it's nice to see another YouTuber try out Godot. So very cool. Righty. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so Godot Mod Player, uh, check it out. It's actually, uh, it, it plays quite a few uh, mod formats. If I, yeah, Mod and XM. So this is one of the other things that I was actually thinking about uh, for uh, the start of my rhythm game, uh, or, you know, at least a start to have some music, is to uh, to grab some, um, um, uh, some mod files or XM files. And then just extract the uh, the drum parts out of there, and um, um, and play the rest. You know, I'll, I'd probably still convert the uh, the XM to an MP3 or, or an ORC file to to play it. Uh, but yeah, there uh, it would be very doable to uh, to to use a mod or XM file as a base for loading in a couple of the, a lot a couple of songs in this. Yeah, you're enjoying it. Oh, very good. Glad to hear it. Um, yeah, because you're originally a Unity developer, aren't you? So, um, glad to hear that, uh, that you're finding Godot fun to do. So, um, what else could we talk about before we call it a night? Because, yeah, it is creeping to uh, 1 a.m. for me. Um, just waiting on seeing if there's anything more showing up in uh, in chat. YouTube is always nice to delay things a little bit. Um, what else can I talk about this other than Yeah, that's the other thing I guess that I need to figure out what I want to do is the interface outside of the drums. So one of the things that I am very keen on when it comes to this game is that I want to keep the action map as simple as possible. Um, I don't want to have complex menu systems here that require you to use different buttons and stuff like that. So I might add um, I might add support for the trigger and that you can do something with the trigger, but I'm also very, um, very keen to just keep it physical. And that means that, um, you know, we would have things near the drums that you can touch with your controller um, to, you know, select songs and stuff like that. So that's also something that we need to work on. You know, again, right now you jump in the game, immediately the song starts playing. We're doing that just to get all the basics working. But eventually the idea, of course, is that you jump in the game and you first have your um, your song selection environment. And again, the other thing, of course, is we now have our drums hard-coded. Eventually I want to create the drums from our song information. Um, so yeah, that's going to be really interesting. Yeah, my experience, Muddy, is that um, you either like it or you don't. And that's the really interesting thing, is that 
there are people who, for whatever reason that they have, once they really fall in love with Godot, suddenly become Unity haters, and I, I really don't get that. But the opposite as well is developers who develop in Unity and then try Godot and they, they don't like it because they are used to working in a very different way and then sort of going like, ah, oh, it's all crap. It's not. It's whatever you prefer and it's whatever you enjoy. You can enjoy both as well. And I'm, you know, I'm really glad to hear when someone comes around and says like, hey, I'm trying out Godot and actually the way that things work here, um, they agree with me and it, it's uh, it's fun to do. Um, I haven't played the game on, what did I shift? Yeah, thank you, Adi. It's uh, um, yeah, it's a it's a bit of a weird experiment for me because, uh, like I said a few times during stream, now I don't even know how to play the drums. So for me to create a uh, a drum rhythm game, also this is my very first time time even trying to create a rhythm game in uh, in Godot. So um, there's quite a few uh, few things that we're learning as we go, but that makes it kind of interesting. Um, Zervo, yeah, um, Paradiddle uh, uh, goes into a bit of a different direction uh, from what I want to accomplish here, because if I understand correctly, or from what I've seen from Paradiddle, uh, that's far more targeted at uh, you know playing quote unquote real drums, including uh, learning um, how to play drums, while the uh, the intent of what I'm making is far more um, arcade-like, uh, you know, it's far more inspired by the the sort of drum games that you would find in in an arcade, where you know someone's physically uh, playing, uh, you know, a, a, a drum game with just you know four drum pedals, and you just have to hit uh, in the beat of the music. Um, so I guess you know it's more akin to crash drums in that respect, um, but. At the same time, I'm trying not to look too much at existing drum games um, because I want this to be just something unique to um, to what we can come up with. And um, we'll see if we succeed in that. Uh, in, in the end, the the end goal for this, if, if I can get it all to work and, and uh, make it a complete game, is just to have a really good example rhythm game for Godot uh, that first of all shows that Godot is capable of creating a full um, XR game uh, of this type, um, but also that then shows, um, you know, uh, other people of, okay, how do you approach something like this? How do you make something like this? What are the sort of things that you need to take in, into account? Yeah, Guitar Hero, you know, there's so many uh, rhythm games out there that, that all work on, you know, similar bases. Um, for those who don't know, because uh, this is one of the things that uh, is a bit of a, uh, a hidden gem. Um, if I can find it. If I'm... Uh, so if you haven't tried this out, you should try this out. Um, um, uh, uh, so this is Dolphin Made in Godot. Uh, it's Benny K. He made this actually in Godot 3 uh, a couple of years ago. Um, Dolphin is a very uh, popular game that was. Uh, uh, I remember what it was made in Godot that originally was a. Uh, so a game jam game that became very popular that really got you now built out. Um, Benny decided to recreate the game in Godot um, originally as a VR game, which is the one that you see here. So instead of you know this is the standard left, right, uh, up, down uh, keyboard rhythm game, uh, but instead of hitting your keyboard, you're now physically with your fists hitting the uh, the four uh, arrow controls uh, that are in front of you. Um, and after he made that work and finished, um, 
that was met with quite a bit of success, uh, success in the uh, Friday Night Funkin' um, user groups. Um, and he has since created a full port in Godot, both VR and non-VR, um, with the blessings of the original developers of this game, which is quite cool. So, uh, so yeah, um, you know, as rhythm ga games go, this is uh, this is exceptionally good. Um, but this is really based on you know your your standard four track um, keyboard based game, um, just recreated in in VR. Um, and I wanted to create something a little bit more um, closer to actually simulating a real drum environment. So yeah, and and we'll see how fast we get there. Maybe someone will uh, will will catch up to me and uh, and and surpass me very quickly because I'm uh, you know uh, I'm I'm dedicating my Friday nights to this, um, and my streams generally you know I try to to stick with a theme like this for as long as I can. But there's often things that come up um, that um, you know that I want to address. Um, you know, in that week's stream. So uh, I know that I haven't been streaming much in the last year. It's been a bit of a crazy uh, one or two years for me. Uh, but I am going to try and uh, stick to the weekly schedule and, and do a stream at least uh, at least once a week. So, um, so yeah, let's hope that, that I can keep up with that. It will be interesting. Thanks, Zervo. Thanks, uh, PH Dave. Uh, good to hear. All right. Anyways, um, guys, I am going to call it a night now. I'm starting to fall asleep. <laughs> um, it is, uh, yeah, it's getting really close to uh, to 1 a.m. here. So um, thanks, everybody, for watching. I hope it was enjoyable. I hope that uh, um, you guys learned something from it. Um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the pro uh, progress that we've made tonight. It's it's really um, coming together, all, all the... Almost all the core features are there now. So it now is a matter of building it out and, and actually getting some songs into this. And uh, that's the one that, I, uh, that I'm that i slightly worried for because even if we have some songs in them, it's also gonna be interesting, but are we even going to be able to play them? But we'll, uh, we'll see. So that's it for me. Thanks all. And um, well, find, me on, uh, find me on Discord. Um, you know, I'm uh, I'm always active on the XR channel on the official Godot Discord. So, if you have any questions, you can always find me there. And uh, otherwise, I will see you guys in a week. Hey, Dapper, <laughs> joining in on the last minute. <laughs>